This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Section 4. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hencods rose. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid light air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like her plate full. Right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there dull and squat. Its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly around a leg of the table with tail on high. Oh, there you are, Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly around a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Purr, scratch my head. Purr. Good evening. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the life black form, clean to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. The cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chicken she is, he said mockingly. Afraid of the chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Cruel. Her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seemed to like it. The cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame-closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went down to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. She cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining wirely in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after. Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps the tips? Or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps? He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs? No, no good, no good eggs with this drought. Want pure, fresh water. Thursday, not a good day either for mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter, a shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Lugach's. While the kettle is boiling, she, she lapped slower, then licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? to lap better, all porous holes. Nothing she can eat? He glanced round him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty. Thin bread and butter she likes in the morning. Still, perhaps once in a way. He said softly in the bare hall, I'm going round the corner. Be back in a minute. And when he had heard his voice say it, he added, 
You don't want anything for breakfast? A soft, sleepy grunt answered. Mm. No, she didn't want anything. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass quats of the bedstead jingle. Must get those settled, really. Pity. All the way from Gibraltar. Forgotten any little Spanish she knew. Wonder what her father gave for it. Old style. Ah, yes, of course. Bought it at the governor's auction. Got a short knock. Hard as nails at a bargain, old sweetie. Yes, sir. At Plevna, that was. I rose from the ranks, sir, and I'm proud of it. Still, he had brains enough to make that corner in stance. Now that was far seen. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy overcoat and his lost property office second-hand waterproof. Stamps, sticky back pictures. Dare say lots of officers are in the swim, too. Of course they do. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely. Plaza's high grand cough. He peeped quickly inside the leather headband. White slip of paper, quite safe. On the doorsteps he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key, not there. In the trousers I left off. Must get it. Potato I have. Creaky wardrobe. No use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door to after him very quietly, more, till the foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold. A limp lid. Look shut. All right till I come back, anyhow. He crossed to the bright side, avoiding the loose cellar flap of number 75. The sun was nearing the steeple of George's church. Be a warm day, I fancy. Especially in these black clothes, feel it more. Black conducts, reflects, refracts, is it? The heat. But I couldn't go in that light suit. Make a picnic of it. His eyelids sank quietly often as he walked in happy warmth. Boland's bread band delivering with trays are daily, but she prefers yesterday's loaves, turnovers, crisp crowns hot. Makes you feel young. Somewhere in the east, early morning, set off at dawn. Travel round in front of the sun. Steal a day's march on it. Keep it up. Forever, never grow a day older, technically. Walk along a strand, strange land. Come to a city gate, sentry there, old rank or two, old Tweety's big mustaches, leaning on a long kind of spear. Wander through on streets, turbaned faces going by, dark caves of carpet shops, big man, Turco the Terrible, seated cross-legged, smoking a coiled pipe. Cries of sellers in the streets. Drink water scented with fennel sherbet. Dands are all day long. Might meet a robber or two. Well, meet him. Getting on to sundown. The shadows of the mosques among the pillar priest with the scroll rolled up. A shiver of the trees. Signal the evening wind. I pass on. Fading gold sky. A mother watches me from her doorway. She calls her children home in their dark language. High wall, beyond strings twanged. Night sky, moon, violet. Color of Molly's new garters. Strings, listen. A girl playing one of those instruments. What do you call them? Dulcimers, I pass. Probably not a bit like it, really. Kind of stuff you read in the track of the sun. Sunburst on the title page. He smiled, pleasing himself. What Arthur Griffin said about the headpiece over the Freeman leader. A home rule sun rising up in the northwest from the laneway behind the Bank of Ireland. He prolonged his pretty smile. I could touch that. Home rule sun rising up in the northwest. He approached Larry O'Rourke's. From the cellar grating floated up the flabby gush of Porter. Through the open doorway, the bar squirted out whiffs of ginger, tea dust, biscuit mush. Good house, however. Just the end of city traffic. For instance, McGalley's down there, 
and G as position. Of course, if they ran a tram line along the North Circular from the cattle market to the quays, the value would go up like a shot. Bald head over the blind, cute old codger. No use canvassing him for an ad. Still, he knows his own business best. There he is, sure enough, my bold Larry, leaning against the sugar bin in his shirt sleeves, watching the apron curate swab up with mop and bucket. Simon Dallas takes him off to a tee with his eyes screwed up. Do you know what I'm going to tell you? What's that, Mr. O'Rourke? Do you know what? The Russians. They'd only be an eight o'clock breakfast for the Japanese. Stop and say a word. About the funeral, perhaps. Sad thing about poor Dingham, Mr. O'Rourke. Turning into Dorset Street, he said freshly in greeting through the doorway. Good day, O'Rourke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. Tis all that. Tis all that. Oh, sorry. Where do they get the money? Coming up red-headed curates from the country, latrium, rinsing empties, an old man in the cellar. Then, lo and behold, they blossom out as Adam Finn latters or down talons. Then, thin of the competition, general thirst, good puzzle, would be cross Dublin without passing a pub. Save it, they can't. Off the drunks, perhaps. Put down three and carry five. What is that? A bob here and there, dribs and drabs. On the wholesale orders, perhaps. Doing a double shuffle with the town travellers. Square it with the boss, and we'll split the job. See? How much would that tot to off the porter in the month? Say, ten barrels of stuff? Say you got ten pence per cent off. Zero more. Fifteen? He passed St. Joseph's National School. Brats. Clamour. Windows open. Fresh air helps a memory. Or a lilt. Ambiish. Defigy. Killer men. Opicure. Rustovi. W. Boys are they? Yes. Inish Turk. Inish Shark. Inish Boffin. But they're jog free. Mine. Sliev Bloom. He halted before Delgucci's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, polonies, black and white. Fifteen multiplied by. The figures whitened in his mind, unsolved, displeased. He let them fade. The shiny links packed with force meat fed his gaze and he breathed in tranquility with the lukewarm breath of the cooked spiced pig's blood. A kidney oozed blood gouts on the willow patterned dish, the last. He stood by the next door's girl at the counter. Would she buy it too? Calling the items from a slip in her hand, chapped, washing soda, and a pound and a half of Denny's sausages. His eyes rested on her vigorous hips. Wood, his name is. Wonder what he does. Wife is oldish. New blood. No followers allowed. Strong pair of arms. Whacking a carpet on the clothesline. She does whack it. By George. The way her crooked skirt swings at each whack. The ferreted-eyed pork butcher folded the sausages. He had snipped off with his blotchy fingers. Sausage pink. Sound meat there, like a stale-fed heifer. He took a page up from the pile of cut sheets. The model farm at Kinnereth on the lake shore of the Tiberius. Can become ideal winter sanatorium. Moss Montefiore. I thought he was. Farmhouse, wall round it, blurred cattle cropping. He held the page from him. Interesting. Read it nearer. The title, the blurred cropping cattle, the page rustling. A young white heifer. Those mornings in the cattle market, the beasts lowering in their pens, 
branded sheep, flop and fall of dung, the breeders in hobnailed boots trudging through the litter, slapping a palm on the ripened hindquarter. There's a prime one. Up peeled switches in their hands. He held the page aslant patiently, bending his senses and his will, his soft subject gaze at rest. The cricket skirt swinging, whack by whack by whack. The port butcher snapped two sheets from the pile, wrapped up her prime sausages, and made a red grimace. Now, my miss, he said. She tendered a coin, smiling boldly, holding her thick wrist out. Thank you, my miss. And one shilling threepence change for you, please. Mr. Boom pointed quickly to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly, behind her moving hands. Pleasant to see the first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it. Make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed down his nose. They never understand. Soda chapped hands, crusted toenails too, brown scapulars in tatters, defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable off duty, cuddling her in Eccles Lane, they like them sizable, prime sausage. Zero, please, Mr. Policeman. I'm lost in the wood. Threepence, please. His hand accepted the moist, tender gland and slipped it into his side pocket. Then it fetched up three coins from his trousers pocket and laid them on the rubber prickles. They lay, were read quickly, and quickly slid, disc by disc, into the till. Thank you, sir. Another time. A speck of eager fire from the foxy eyes thanked him. He withdrew his gaze after an instant. No, better not. Another time. Good morning, he said, moving away. Good morning, sir. No sign, gone, what matter? He walked back along Dorset Street, reading gravely. Agendath Natan Planters Company to purchase waste sandy tracts from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees. Excellent for shade, fuel and construction, orange groves and immense melon fields north of Jaffa. You pay 80 marks and they plant a dunam of land for you with olives, oranges, almonds or citrons. Olives cheaper, oranges need artificial irrigation. Every year you get a sending of the crop. Your name entered for life as owner in the Book of the Union can pay 10 down in the balance in yearly installments. Bliebestrasse, 34, Berlin, West 15. Nothing doing, still an idea behind it. He looked at the cattle, blurred in silver heat, silver powdered olive trees, quiet long days, pruning, ripening. Olives are packed in jars, eh? I have a few left from Andrews. Molly spitting them out, knows the taste of them now. Oranges and tissue paper packed in crates. Citrons, too. Wonder, is poor Citron still in St. Kevin's Parade? And Mastiansky with the old Sither. Pleasant evenings he had then. Molly in Citron's basket chair. Nice to hold, cool waxen fruit. Hold in the hand, lift it to the nostrils and smell the perfume. Like that heavy, sweet, wild perfume. Always the same, year after year. They fetched high prices, too, Moisel told me. Our Buddhist place, pleasant street, pleasant old times. Must be without a flaw, he said, coming all that way, Spain, Gibraltar, Mediterranean, the Levant, crates lined up on the quayside at Jaffa, chap ticking them off in a book, navvies handling them barefoot in soiled dungarees. There's, what do you call him out of? How do you? Doesn't see. Chap, you know, just a salute, bit of a bore. His back is like that Norwegian captain's. Wonder if I'll meet him today. Watering cart, to provoke the rain. On earth as it is in heaven, a cloud began to cover the sun, slowly, holy, gray, far. No, not like that. A barren land, bare waste, volcanic lake, a dead sea, no fish, weedless, sunk deep in the earth. No wind could lift those waves, gray metal, poisonous, foggy waters. 
Brimstone, they called it, raining down. The cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Edom, all dead names, a dead sea and a dead land, gray and old. Old now. It bore the oldest, the first race, a bent hag crossed from Cassidy's, clutching a nagging bottle by the neck. The oldest people wandered far away over all the earth, captivity to captivity, multiplying, dying, being born everywhere. It lay there now. Now it could bear no more. Dead, an old woman's, the gray, sunken cunt of the world. Desolation. Gray horror seared his flesh. Folding the page into his pocket, he turned into Echo Street, hurrying homeward. Cold oil slid along his veins, chilling his blood, age crusting him with a salt cloak. Well, I am here now. Yes, I am here now. Morning mouth bad images. Got up wrong side of the bed. Must begin again those sandals exercises on the hands down. Blotchy brown brick houses. Number 80 still unlet. Why is that? Valuation is only 28. Towers, Battersby, North, MacArthur. Parlor windows plastered with bills. Plasters on a sore eye to smell the gentle smoke of tea. Fume of the pan, sizzling butter. Be near her, ample, bed-warmed flesh. Yes, yes. Quick, warm sunlight came running from Berkeley Road, swiftly, in slim sandals, along the brightening footpath. Runs, she runs to meet me, a girl with gold hair on the wind. Two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stooped and gathered them. Mrs. Marion Bloom. His quickened heart slowed at once. Bold hand, Miss Marion. Poldy! Entering the bedroom, he half-closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullingar, Millie. A letter for me from Millie, he said carefully, and a card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the twill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs halfway, his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under her pillow. That do, he asked, turning. She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things, she said. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Hurry up with that tea, she said. I'm parched. The kettle is boiling, he said. But he delayed to clear the chair, her striped petticoat, tossed soiled linen, and lifted in, all, in an armful on the foot of the bed. As he went down the kitchen stairs, she called, Poldy! What? Scald the teapot. On the boil, sure enough, a plume of steam from the spout. He scalded and rinsed out the teapot and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle then to let the water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle, crushed the pan flat on the live coals, and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. While he unwrapped the kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. So they won't eat pork, kosher. Here, he let the blood-smeared paper fall to her and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper? He sprinkled it through his fingers, ringwise from the chipped egg cup. Then he slid open his letter, glancing down the page and over. Thanks, Nick Tam, Mr. Collin, Lock Owl Picnic, Young Student, Blazes Bowl, and Seaside Girls. The tea was drawn. He filled his own mustache cup, sham crown, derby, smiling. Silly Millie's birthday gift. Only five she was then. Oh, no, wait, four. I gave her the Ambroid necklace she broke, putting pieces of folded brown paper in the letter box for her. He smiled, pouring. Oh, Millie Bloom, you are my darling. You are my looking glass from night to morning. I'd rather have you without a farthing than Katie Keon with her ass and garden. Poor old Professor Goodwin. Dreadful old case. Still, he was a courteous old chap. Old-fashioned way he used to bow Molly off the platform. And the little mirror in his silk hat. The night Millie brought it into the parlor. <gasps> Look what I found in Professor Goodwin's hat! We all laughed. Sex breaking out even then. Her little piece she was. He prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it? 
bread and butter, four, sugar, spoon, cream, yeah. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were, she said. He set the, she set the pillow brasses jingling as she raised herself briskly, an elbow on the pillow. He looked calmly down on her bulk and between her large, soft bubs, sloping within her nightdress like a she-goat's udder. The warmth of her couched body rose on the air, mingling with the fragrance of the tea she poured. A strip of torn envelope peeped from under the dimpled pillow. In the act of going, he stayed to straighten the bedspread. Who was the letter from? he asked. Bold hand, Marion. Oh, Boylan, she said. He's bringing the program. What are you singing? La Chia Darem with J.C. Doyle, she said, and, and Love's Old Sweet Song. Her full lips drinking smiled. Rather stale smell that incense leaves next day, like foul flower water. Would you like the window open a little? She doubled a slice of bread in her mouth, asking, What time is the funeral? Eleven, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. Following the pointing of her finger, he took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No? Then a twisted gray garter looped round a stocking, rumpled shiny sole. No, that book. Other stocking? Her petticoat? It must have fell down, she said. He felt here and there. Voglio e non vorrei. Wonder if she pronounces that right, Voglio. Not in the bed, must have slid down. He stooped and lifted the valence. The book, fallen, sprawled against the bulge of the orange keyed chamber pot. Show here, she said. I put a mark in it. There's a word I want to ask you. She swallowed a draft of tea from her cup and held, held by the knot handle, and having wiped her fingers smartly on the blanket, began to search the text with her, with her hairpin till she reached the word. Met him what? he asked. Here, she said. What does that mean? He leaned downward and read near her polished thumbnail. Met him psychosis? Yeah. Who's he when he's at home? Metempsychosis, he said, frowning. It's Greek, from the Greek. That means the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks, she said. Tell us in plain words. He smiled, glancing askance at her mocking eyes. Same young eyes. First night after the charades, Dolphin's Barn. He turned over the smudged pages. Ruby, the pride of the ring. Hello, illustration. Fierce Italian with carriage whip. Must be Ruby Pride of the on the floor naked. <laughs> she kindly lent. The monster mafia desisted and flung his victim from him with an oath. Cruelty behind it all. Doped animals, trapeze and hanglers. Had to look the other way. Mob gaping. Break your neck and we'll break our sides. Families of them. Bone them young so they met him psychosis. That we live with after death. Our souls. That a man's soul after he's di he dies. Dignum soul. Did you finish it? He asked. Yeah, she said. There's nothing smutty in it. Was she in love with the first fellow all the time? Never read it. Do you want another? Yes. Get another of Paul de Cox. Nice name he has. She poured more tea into her cup, watching it flow sideways. Must get that Capel Street Library book renewed, or they'll write to Kearney, my guarantor. Reincarnation, that's the word. Some people believe, he said, that we go on living in another body after death that we lived before. They call it reincarnation, that we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago or some other planet. They say we've forgotten it. They say, some say they remember their past lives. The sluggish cream wound curdling spirals through her tea. That reminded her of the word metempsychosis. An example would be better. An example? The bath of the nymph over the bed, given away with the Easter number of photo bits. Splendid masterpiece in art colors. Tea before you put milk in? Not unlike her with her hair down, slimmer. Three and six I gave for the frame. She said it would look nice over the bed, naked nymphs, grace. And for all instance, and for instance, all the people that lived then. He turned the pages back. Metempsychosis, he said, is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance. What they called nymphs, for example. Her spoons ceased to stir up the sugar. 
She gazed straight before her, inhaling through her arched nostrils. There's a smell of burn, she said. Did you leave anything on the fire? <gasps> the kidney, he cried suddenly. He fitted the book roughly into his inner pocket and stubbing his toes against the broken commode, hurried out toward the smell, stepping hastily down the stairs with a flurried stork's legs. Pungent smoke shot up in an angry jet from a side of the pan. By prodding a prong of the fork under the kidney, he detached it and turned it turtle on its back, only a little burnt. He tossed it off the pan onto a plate and let the scanty brown gravy trickle over it. Cup of tea now. He sat down, cut and buttered a slice of the loaf. He shore away the burnt flesh and flung it to the cat. Then he put a forkful into his mouth, chewing with discernment the toothsome pliant meat. Done to a turn. A mouthful of tea, then he cut away the dyes of bread, sopped one in the gravy and put it in his mouth. What was that about some young student and a picnic? He creased out the letter at his side, reading it slowly as he chewed, sopping another dye of bread in the gravy and raising it to his mouth. Dearest Papley, thanks ever so much for the lovely birthday present. It suits me splendid. Everyone says I'm quite the belle in my new tan. I got Mummy's lovely box of creams and am writing. They are lovely. I'm getting on swimming in the photo business now. Mr. Coglin took one of me and Mrs. will send when developed. We did great biz yesterday. Fair day and all the beef to the heels we're in. We are going to Loch Owl on Monday with a few friends to make a scrap picnic. Give my love to Mummy and to yourself a big kiss and thanks. I hear them at the piano downstairs. There is to be a concert in the Grenville Arms on Saturday. There is a young student comes here some evenings named Bannon, his cousins or something a big swells, and he sings Boylan's, I was on the pop of writing Blazer's Boylan's, song about those seaside girls. Tell him Silly Millie sends his best respects. I must now close with fondest love, your fond daughter, Millie. P.S. Excuse bad writing, am in hurry. Bye-bye, M. 15 yesterday, curious 15th of the month too, her first birthday away from home, separation, remember the summer morning she was born, running to knock up Mrs. Thornton in Denzel Street, jolly old woman, lots of babies she must have helped into the world, she knew from the first poor little Rudy wouldn't live, well God is good sir, she knew at once, he would be 11 now if he had lived, his vacant face stared pityingly at the postscript, excuse bad writing, hurry, Piano downstairs, coming out of her shell. Row with her in the XL cafe about the bracelet. Wouldn't eat her cakes or speak or look, sauce box. He sopped other dyes of bread in the gravy and ate piece after piece of kidney. Twelve and six a week. Not much. Still, she might do worse. Music hall stage, young student. He drank a draught of cooler tea to wash down his meal. Then he read the letter again, twice. Oh well. She knows how to mind herself, but if not, no, nothing has happened. Of course it might. Wait, in any case, until it does. A wild piece of goods, of slim legs running up the staircase, destiny ripening now, vain, very. He smiled with troubled affection at the kitchen window. Day I caught her in the street, pinching her cheeks to make them red, anemic a little, was given milk too long. On the errands king that day, round the kish, damned old tub pitching about, not a bit funky. Her pale blue scarf loose in the wind with her hair. All dimpled cheeks and curls, your head it simply swirls. Seaside girls, torn envelope hands stuck in his trousers pockets. Javi off for the day, singing. Friend of the family, swirls, he says, peer with lamps, summer evening band. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Millie too, young kisses, the first, far away now past, Mrs. Marion, Redding, lying back now, counting the strands of her hair, smiling, braiding. A soft qualm, regret, flowed down his backbone, increasing. Will happen, yes, prevent, useless, can't move. Girl's sweet, light lips will happen too. He felt the flowing qualm spread over him. Useless to move now, lips kissed, kissing kissed, full gluey women's lips. Better where she is down there, away, occupier. Wanted a dog to pass the time. Might take a trip down there, August, bank holiday. Only two and six return, six weeks off, however. Might work a press pass or through McCoy. The cat, having cleaned all her fur, 
returned to the meat-stained paper, nosed at it and stalked to the door. She looked back at him, mewing. Wants to go out. Wait before a t door sometime. It will open. Let her wait. Has the fidgets. Electric thunder in the air. Was washing at her ear with her back to the fire, too. He felt heavy, full, then the gentle loosening of his bowels. He stood up, undoing the waistband of his trousers. The cat mewed at him. Meow, he said in answer. Wait till I'm ready. Heaviness, hot day coming. Too much trouble to fag up the stairs to the landing. A paper. He liked to read at stool. Hope no ape comes knocking just as I'm... In the table drawer, he found an old number of titbits. He folded it under his armpit, went to the door and opened it. The cat went up in soft bounds. Ah, wanted to go upstairs, curl up in a ball on the bed. Listening, he heard her voice. Come, come, pussy, come. He went out through the back door into the garden, stood to listen towards the next garden. No sound perhaps hanging clothes out to dry. The maid was in the garden. Fine morning. He bent down to regard a lean file of spearmint growing up the wall. Make a summer house here. Scarlet runners, Virginia creepers. Want to manure the whole place over. Scabby soil. A coat of liver of sulfur. All soil like that without dung. Household slops. Loam. What is this that is? The hens in the next garden. Their droppings are very good top dressing. Best of all, though, are the cattle, especially they, when they are fed on those oil cakes. Mulch of dung. Best thing to clean ladies' kid gloves. Dirty cleans. Ashes, too. Reclaim the whole place. Grow peas in that corner there. Lettuce. Always have fresh greens, then. Still, gardens have their drawbacks. That bee or blue bottle here, Whit Monday. He walked on. Where's my hat, by the way? Must have put it back on the peg. Or hanging up on the floor. Funny, I don't remember that. Hall stand too full. Four umbrellas, her rain cloak. Picking up the letters. Drago's shop bell ringing. Queer, I was just thinking that moment. Brown brilliantined hair over his collar. Just had a wash and brush up. Wonder, have I time for a bath this morning? Terra Street. Chap in the pay box. There got away James Stevens, they say. O'Brien. Deep voice that fellow Dlugach has. Agenda, what is it? Now, my miss, enthusiast. He kicked open the crazy door of the Jake's. Better be careful not to get these trousers dirty for the funeral. He went in, bowing his head under the low lintel. Leaving the door ajar, amid the stench of moldy lime wash and stale cobwebs, he undid his braces. Before sitting down, he peered through a chink at the next door windows. The king was in his counting house. Nobody. A squat on the cuck stool, he folded out his paper turning its pages over on his bared knees. Something new and easy. No great hurry. Keep it a bit. Our prize titbit. Matcham's Master Stroke. Written by Mr. Philip Beaufoy, Playgoer Playgoers Club, London. Payment at the rate of one guinea a column has been made to the writer. Three and a half. Three pounds three. Three pounds thirteen six. Quietly he read, restraining himself. The first column and, yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently, that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. Hope it's not too big, bring on piles again. No, just right. So, ah, uh, costive. One tabloid of Cascara Sagrada. Life might be so. It did not move or touch him, but it was something quick and neat. Print anything now. Silly season. 
He read on, seated, calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. Matcham often thinks of the masterstroke by which he won the laughing witch who now begins and ends morally, hand in hand. Smart. He glanced back through what he had read and, while feeling his water flow quietly, he envied kindly Mr. Beaufoy who had written it and received payment of three pounds, thirteen and six. Might manage a sketch by Mr. and Mrs. L. M. Bloom. Invent a story for some proverb. Which? Time I used to try jotting down on my cuff what she said dressing. Disliked dressing together. Nicked myself shaving. Biting her nether lip. Hooking the placket of her skirt. Timing her. 9.15. Did Roberts pay you yet? 9.20. What had Greta Conroy on? 9.23. What possessed me to buy this comb? 9.24. I'm swelled after all that cabbage. A speck of dust on the patent leather of her boot. Rubbing smartly in turn each welt against her stocking calf. Morning after the bazaar dance when May's band played Poncielli's Dance of the Hours. Explain that. Morning hours. Noon. Then evening coming on. Then night hours. Washing her teeth. That was the first night. Her head dancing. Her fantastics clicking. Is that Boylan well off? He has money. Why? I noticed he had a good rich smell off his breath dancing. No use humming then. Allude to it. Strange kind of music that last night. The mirror was in shadow. She rubbed her hand glass briskly on her woolen vest against her full wagging bub. Peering into it. Lines in her eyes. It wouldn't pan out somehow. Evening hours, girls in gray gauze. Night hours then, black with daggers and eye masks. Poetical idea, pink, then golden, then gray, then black. Still true to life also, day, then the night. He tore away half the prize story sharply and wiped himself with it. Then he girded up his trousers, braced and buttoned himself. He pulled back the jerky, shaky door of the jakes and came forth from the gloom into the air. In the bright light, lightened and cooled in limb, he eyed carefully his black trousers, the ends, the knees, the huffs of the knees. What time is the funeral? Better find out in the paper. A creak and a dark whir in the air high up, the bells of George's church. They told the hour, loud, dark, iron. Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Quarter two, there again, the overtone following through the air. A third, poor Dignam. End of section four, read by David Cozy, Kasumi, Susan Hooks, Robin Hunt, Todd McQuillan, Kristen McQuillan, Jeremy Hidley, Tokyo, Japan, November, December 7th, 2005. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses, Chapter 5 By lorries along Sir John Rogerson's Quay, Mr. Bloom walked soberly, past Windmill Lane, Leesk's The Linseed Crusher, the Postal Telegraph Office. Could have given that address, too, and passed the sailor's home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside, and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages a boy for the skins lolled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fag-butt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask-hoop. Tell him if he smokes he won't grow. Oh, let him. His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come home to Ma, Da. 
Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, past the frowning face of Bethel. L, yes, house of Aleph Beth, and past Nichols the undertaker. At eleven it is. Time enough. Dare say Corny Kelleher bagged the job for O'Neill's, singing with his eyes shut. Corny. Met her once in the park, in the dark. What a lark! Police tout. Her name and address she then told, with my turalum turalum te. Oh, surely he bagged it. Bury him cheap in a what you call it. With my turalum 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 turalum. In Westland Row, he halted before the windows of the Belfast and Oriental Tea Company, and read the legends of lead-papered packets, choice blend, finest quality family tea. Rather warm. Tea. Must get some from Tom Kernan. Couldn't ask him at a funeral, though. While his eyes still read blandly, he took off his hat quietly, inhaling his hair oil, and sent his right hand with slow grace over his brow and hair. Very warm morning. Under their dropped lids, his eyes found the tiny bow of the leather headband inside his high-grade hat. Just there. His right hand came down into the bowl of his hat. His fingers found quickly a card behind the headband and transferred it to his waistcoat pocket. So warm. His right hand once more slowly went over his brow and hair. Then he put on his hat again, relieved, and read again. Choice blend, made of the finest Ceylon brands, the Far East. Lovely spot it must be, the garden of the world, big lazy leaves to float about on, cactuses, flowering meads, snaky lianas, they call them. Wonder is it like that. Those Singalese lobbing about in the sun in dolce far niente. Not doing a hand's turn all day. Sleep six months out of twelve. Too hot to quarrel. Influence of the climate. Lethargy. Flowers of idleness. The air feeds most. As oats. Hothouse in botanic gardens. Sensitive plants. Water lilies. Petals too tired to. Sleeping sickness in the air. Walk on rose leaves. Imagine trying to eat tripe and cow heel. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? Ah, yes, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back, reading a book with a parasol open. Couldn't sink if you tried. So thick with salt. Because the weight of the water... Uh, no. The weight of the body in the water is equal to the weight of the what or is it the volume is equal to the weight it's a law something like that vance in high school cracking his finger joints teaching the college curriculum cracking curriculum what is weight really when you say the weight 32 feet per second per second law of falling bodies per second per second they all fall to the ground the earth. It's the force of gravity of the earth is the weight. He turned away and sauntered across the road. How did she walk with her sausages? Like that something. As he walked, he took the folded freeman from his side pocket, unfolded it, rolled it lengthwise in a baton, and tapped it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. Careless air. Just drop in to see. Per second, per second. Per second for every second, it means. From the curbside, he darted a keen glance through the door of the post office. Too late, box. Post here. No one. In. He handed the card through the brass grill. Are there any letters for me? he asked. 
while the postmistress searched a pigeonhole, he gazed at the recruiting poster, with soldiers of all arms on parade, and held the tip of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh printed rag paper. No answer, probably. Went too far last time. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked her and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower, Esquire, care of P.O. Box, Westland Row, City. Answered anyhow. He slipped card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment? Cast-off soldier. There, bearskin cap and hackle plume. No, he's a grenadier. Pointed cuffs. There he is, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, red coats. Too showy. That must be why the women go after them. Uniform. Easier to enlist and drill. Maud Gaughan's letter about taking them off O'Connell Street at night. Disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now, an army rotten with venereal disease, overseas or half-seas over empire. Half-baked they look, hypnotized like eyes front, mark time, table, able, bed, id. The king's own, never see him dress up as a fireman or a bobby. A mason? Yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned to the right. Talk, as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket, and a forefinger felt its way under the flap of the envelope, ripping it open in jerks. Women will pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter, the letter, and crumpled the envelope in his pocket. Something pinned on, photo, perhaps, Hair? No. McCoy. Get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. Hate company when you... Hello, Bloom. Where are you off to? Hello, McCoy. Nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine. How are you? I'll just keep him alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black tie and clothes. He asked with low respect. Is there any... No oh, trouble, I hope. I, I see you're... Oh, no, Mr. Bloom said. Poor Dignam, you know. The funeral is today. To be sure, poor fellow, so it is. What time? A photo it isn't. A badge, maybe. Eh, uh, eleven, Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out there, McCoy said. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. Who is telling me? A uh, Hollahan. You know Hoppy. I know. Mr. Bloom gazed across the road at the outsider drawn up before the door of the Grosvenor. The porter hoisted the valise up on the well. She stood still waiting, while the man, husband, brother, like her, searched his pockets for change. Stylish kind of coat with that roll collar, warm for a day like this. Looks like blanket cloth. Careless stand of her with her hands in those patch pockets, like that haughty creature at the polo match. Women all for caste till you touch the spot. Handsome is and handsome does. Reserved about to yield. The honorable Mrs. and Brutus is an honorable man. Possess her once, take the starch out of her. I was with Bob Doran. He's on one of his periodical bends, and what do you call him? A bantam Lyons, uh, just down there in Conway's we were. Doran Lyons in Conway's. She raised a gloved hand to her hair. In came Hoppy. Having a wet. Drawing back his head and gazing far from beneath his veiled eyelids, he saw the bright fawn skin shine in the glare the braided drums. Clearly I can see today. Moisture about gives long sight, perhaps. Talking of one thing or another, lady's hand, which side will she get up? 
And he said, sad thing about our poor friend Paddy. What Paddy, I said. Poor little Paddy Dignam, he said. Off to the country. Broadstone, probably. High brown boots with laces dangling. Well-turned foot. What is he foostering over that change for? Sees me looking. Eye out for other fellows, always. Good fallback. Two strings to her bow. Why, I said. What's wrong with him, I said. Proud. Rich. Silk stockings. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He moved a little to the side of McCoy's talking head, getting up in a minute. What's wrong with him, he said. He's dead, he said. And faith he filled up. Is it Paddy Dignam, I said. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I was with him no later than Friday last, or Thursday was it, in the arch. Yes, he said, he's gone. He died on Monday, poor fellow. Watch, watch. Silk, flash, rich stockings, white watch. A heavy tram car honking its gong slewed between. Lost it. Curse your noisy pug nose. Feels locked out of it. Paradise and the Perry. Always happening like that. The very moment. Girl in Eustace Street halfway Monday. Was it settling her garter? Her friend covering the display of it. Esprit de corps. Well, what are you gaping at? Yes, yes, Mr. Bloom said after a dull sigh. Another gone. One of the best, McCoy said. The tram passed. They drove off towards the loop-line bridge, her rich gloved hand on the steel grip. Flicker, flicker, the lace flare of her hat in the sun. Flicker, flick. Wife well, I suppose, McCoy's changed voice said. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tip-top, thanks. He unrolled the newspaper baton idly and read idly. What is home without plum trees potted meat? Incomplete. With it... An abode of bliss. My missus has got an engagement. At least it's not settled yet. Valise tack again. By the way, no harm. I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large-lidded eyes with unhasty friendliness. My wife, too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast, on the 25th. That's so, McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom, not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom eating bread and... No book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man. Letter. Cat, furry, black ball. Torn strip of envelope. Love's old sweet song. Comes love's old. It's a kind of tour, don't you see? Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his mustache double. Oh, well, he said. That's good news. He moved to go. Well, glad to see you're looking fit, he said. Meet you knocking around. Yes. Mr. Bloom said. Tell you what, McCoy said. You might put down my name at the funeral, will you? I'd like to go, but I mightn't be able, you see. There's a drowning case at Sandy Cove may turn up, and then the coroner and myself would have to go down if the body is found. You just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Bloom said, moving to get off. That'll be all right. Right, McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'd go if I possibly could. Well, till all. Just C.P. McCoy will do. That will be done, Mr. Bloom answered firmly. Didn't catch me napping that wheeze, the quick touch, soft mark. I'd like my job. Valise I have a particularly fancy for leather, capped corners, riveted edges, double action, lever lock. Bob Cowley lent him his for the Wicklow Regatta concert last year and never heard tidings of it from that good day till this. Mr. Bloom, 
strolling towards Brunswick Street, smiled. My missus has just gotten. Reedy, freckled soprano. Cheese-pairing nose. Nice enough in its way, for a little ballad. No guts in it. You and me, don't you know, in the same boat. Soft soaping. Give you the needle, that would. Can't he hear the difference? Think he's that way inclined a bit. Against my grain, somehow. Thought that Belfast would fetch him. I hope that smallpox up there doesn't get worse. Suppose she wouldn't let herself be vaccinated again. Your wife and my wife. Wonder, is he pimping after me? Mr. Bloom stood at the corner, his eyes wandering over the multicolored hoardings. Cantrell and Cochran's ginger ale, aromatic, Cleary's summer sale. No, he's going on straight. Hello, Leah tonight. Mrs. Bandman Palmer. Like to see her again in that. Hamlet she played last night, male impersonator. Perhaps he was a woman. Why Ophelia committed suicide. Poor Papa. How he used to talk of Kate Bateman in that. Outside the Adelphi in London. Waited all the afternoon to get in. Year before I was born, that was. Sixty-five. And Ristori in Vienna. What is this the right name is? By Mosenthal it is. Rachel, is it? No. The scene he was always talking about where the old blind Abraham recognizes the voice and puts his fingers on the face. Nathan's voice. His son's voice. I hear the voice of Nathan who left his father to die of grief and misery in my arms, who left the house of his father and left the god of his father. Every word is so deep, Leopold. Poor Papa, poor man. I'm glad I didn't go into the room to look at his face that day. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Phew. Well, perhaps it was best for him. Mr. Bloom went round the corner and passed the drooping nags of the hazard. No use thinking of it any more. Nosebag time. Wish I hadn't met that McCoy fellow. He came nearer and heard a crunching of gilded oats, the gently chomping teeth. Their full buck eyes regarded him as he went by, amid the sweet oaten reek of horse piss. Their El Dorado. Poor Jugginses. Damn all they know or care about anything with their long noses stuck in their nose bags. Too full for words. Still they get their feet all right and their doss. Gelded, too. A stump of black gutta percha wagging limp between their haunches. Might be happy all the same that way. Good poor brutes they look. Still their neigh can be very irritating. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded it into the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabman's shelter. Curious, the life of drifting cabbies. All weathers, all places, time are set down. No will of their own. Voglio e non. Like to give them an odd cigarette. Sociable. Shout a few flying syllables as they pass. He hummed. La si derem la mano. La 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 la. He turned into Cumberland Street, going on some paces, halted in the lee of the station wall. No one. Mead's timber yard, piled bulks, ruins, and tenements. With careful tread he passed over a hopscotch court with its forgotten picky stone. Not a sinner. Near the timber yard a squatted child at marvels alone, shooting the taw with a cunny thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watched from her warm sill. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle not to wake her. Open it. And once I played marbles when I went to that old dame's school. She liked Minonette, Mrs. Ellis's, and Mr. 
He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower, I think it's a... a yellow flower with flattened petals. Not annoyed, then. What does she say? Dear Henry, I got your last letter to me, and thank you very much for it. I'm sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I'm awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other word. Please tell me, what is the real meaning of that word? Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me what you think of poor me. I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often you have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about it. Please write me a long letter and tell me more. Remember, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not write. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patience are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I have such a bad headache today. And write by return to your longing Martha. P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use. I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhole, smelt its almost no smell, and placed it in his heart pocket. Language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear. Or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips with you, darling man-flower, punish your cactus if you don't please poor forget-me-not. How I long violets to hear roses when we soon anemone meet all naughty night-stock wife Martha's perfume. Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his side pocket. Weak joy opened his lips, changed since the first letter. Wonder did she wrote it herself, doing the indignant. A girl of good family like me, respectable character, could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you, not having any. Usual love scrimmage, then running round corner, bad as a row with Molly. A cigar has a cooling effect, narcotic. Go further next time. Naughty boy. Punish. Afraid of words, of course. Brutal, why not? Try it anyhow. A bit at a time. Fingering still the letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out of it. Common pin, eh? He threw it on the road, out of her clothes somewhere, pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always have. No roses without thorns. Flat Dublin voices bawled in his head. Those two sluts that night in the coom, linked together in the rain. Oh, Mary lost the pin of her drawers. She didn't know what to do, to keep it up, to keep it up. It? Them. Such a bad headache. Has her roses, probably. We're sitting all day typing. I focus bad for stomach nerves. What perfume does your wife use? Now, could you make out a thing like that? To keep it up. Martha. Mary. I saw that picture somewhere. I forget now. Old master or faked for money. He is sitting in their house talking mysterious. Also, the two sluts in the coom would listen. To keep it up. Nice kind of evening feeling. No more wandering about, just... Lull there, quiet dusk, let everything rip, forget. Tell about places you've been, strange customs. The other one jar on her head was getting the supper, fruit, olives, lovely cool water out of a well, stone cold like the hole in the wall at Ashtown. Must carry a paper goblet next time I go to the 
trotting matches. She listens with big, dark, soft eyes. Tell her, more and more, all, then a sigh, silence, long, long, long rest. Going under the railway arch, he took out the envelope, tore it swiftly in shreds, and scattered them towards the road. The shreds fluttered away, sank in the dank air, a white flutter, then all sank. Henry Flower. You could tear up a check for a hundred pounds in the same way. Simple bit of paper. Lord Ivy once cashed a seven-figure check for a million in the Bank of Ireland. Shows you the money to be made out of porter. Still, the other brother, Lord Ardelon, has to change his shirt four times a day, they say. Skin breeds lice or vermin. A million pounds. Wait a moment. Two pence a pint, four pence a quart, eight pence a gallon of porter. No, one and four pence a gallon of porter. One and four into twenty, fifteen about... Yes, exactly. Fifteen millions of barrels of porter. What am I saying? Barrels, gallons, about a million barrels all the same. An incoming train clanked heavily above his head, coach after coach. Barrels bumped in his head. Dull porter slopped and churned inside. The bungholes sprang open and a huge dull flood leaked out, flowing together, winding through mud flats all over the level land, a lazy, pooling swirl of liquor bearing along wide-leaved flowers of its froth. He had reached the open back door of All Hallows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat, took the card from his pocket, and tucked it again behind the leather headband. Damn it! I might have tried to work McCoy for a pass to Mullingar. Same note as on the door. Sermon by the very Reverend John Conmey, S.J., on St. Peter Claver, S.J., and the African Mission. Prayers for the conversion of Gladstone they had, too, when he was almost unconscious. The Protestants are the same. Convert Dr. William J. Walsh, D.D., to the true religion. Save China's millions. Wonder how they explain it to the heathen Chinese. Prefer an ounce of opium. Celestials. Rank heresy for them. Buddha, their god, lying on his side in the museum, taking it easy with his hand under his cheek. Jaw sticks burning. Not like Ecce Homo. Crown of thorns and cross. Clever idea, St. Patrick the Shamrock. Chopsticks? Con me. Martin Cunningham knows him. Distinguished looking. Sorry I didn't work him about getting Molly into the choir instead of that Father Farley who looked a fool but wasn't. They're taught that. He's not going out in bluey specks with the sweat rolling off him to baptize blacks, is he? The glasses would take their fancy flashing. Like to see them sitting round in a ring with Blub lips, entranced, listening, still life, lap it up like milk, I suppose. Cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door, and entered softly by the rear. Something going on, some sodality. Pity so empty, nice discreet place to be next some girl. Who is my neighbor? Jammed by the hour to slow music, that woman at midnight mass. Seventh heaven. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters round their necks, heads bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stopped at each, took out a communion, shook a drop or two. Are they in water? Off it and put it neatly into her mouth. Her hat and head sank. Then the next one, her hat sank at once. Then the next one, a small old woman. The priest bent down to put it into her mouth, murmuring all the time, Latin. The next one, shut your eyes and open your mouth. What? Corpus, body, corpse. Good idea, the Latin. Stupefies them first. Hospice for the dying. They don't seem to chew it, only swallow it down. 
rum idea, eating bits of a corpse. Why, the cannibals cotton to it. He stood aside, watching their blind masks pass down the aisle one by one and seek their places. He approached a bench and seated himself in its corner, nursing his hat and newspaper. These pots we have to wear. We ought to have hats modeled on our heads. They were about him here and there, with heads still bowed in their crimson halters, waiting for it to melt in their stomachs. Something like those matzo. It's that sort of bread, unleavened shoe bread. Look at them. Now I bet it makes them feel happy, lollipop. It does, yes. Bread of angels, it's called. There's a big idea behind it, kind of kingdom of God is within you feel. First communicants, hokey-pokey, penny a lump. Then feel all like one family party. Same in the theater, all in the same swim. They do, I'm sure of that. Not so lonely in our confraternity. Then come out a bit spreeish, let off steam. Thing is, if you really believe in it, Lourdes cure. Waters of oblivion and the knock apparition, statues bleeding. Old fellow asleep near the confession box, hence those snores, blind faith. Safe in the arms of kingdom come, lulls all pain. Wake this time next year. He saw the priest stow the communion cup away, well in, and kneel an instant before it, showing a large gray boot sole from under the lace affair he had on. Suppose he lost a pin of his. He wouldn't know what to do to. Bald spot behind, letters on his back. I-N-R-I? -I? No. I-H-S. Molly told me one time I asked her, I have sinned. Or no. I have suffered, it is. And the other one? Iron nails ran in. Meet one Sunday after the rosary. Do not deny my request. Turn up with a veil and black bag. Dusk and the light behind her. She might be here with a ribbon round her neck and do the other thing all the same on the sly. Their character. That fellow that turned Queen's evidence on the Invincibles he used to receive the... Carey was his name, the communion every morning. This very church, Peter Carey, yes. No, Peter Claver, I'm thinking of. Dennis Carey. And just imagine that wife and six children at home, and plotting that murder all the time. Those craw thumpers. Now that's a good name for them. There's always something shifty looking about them. They're not straight men of business either. Oh no, she's not here. The flower. No, no. By the way, did I tear up that envelope? Yes, under the bridge. The priest was rinsing out the chalice. Then he tossed off the dregs smartly. Wine makes it more aristocratic than, for example, if he drank what they used to, Guinness's Porter or some temperance beverage, Wheatley's Dublin Hop Bitters or Cantrell and Cochrane's Ginger Ale Aromatic. It doesn't give them any of it. Shoe wine. Only the other. Cold comfort. Pious fraud, but quite right. Otherwise they'd have one old boozer worse than another coming along, cadging for a drink. Queer the whole atmosphere of the... Quite right, perfectly right, that is. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music. Pity. Who has the organ here, I wonder? Old Glynn, he knew how to make that instrument talk. The vibrato. Fifty pounds a year, they say, he had in Gardner Street. Molly was in fine voice that day. The stabat mater of Rossini. Father Bernard Vaughan's sermon first. Christ or Pilate? Christ, but don't keep us all night over it. Music they wanted. Foot drill stopped. Could hear pin drop. I told her to pitch her voice against that corner. I could feel the thrill in the air, the full, the people looking up. Qui est homo? Some of that old sacred music, splendid. Mercadante. Seven last words. Mozart's twelfth mass, Gloria in that. Those old popes keen on music. 
and art and statues and pictures of all kinds. Palestrina, for example, too. They had a gay old time while it lasted. Healthy, too, chanting regular hours, then brew liquors, Benedictine, green chartreuse. Still, having eunuchs in their choir, that was coming it a bit thick. What kind of voice is it? Must be curious to hear after their own strong basses. Connoisseurs. Suppose they wouldn't feel anything after all. Kind of a placid, no worry. Fall into flesh, don't they? Gluttons. Tall, long legs. Who knows? Eunuch. One way out of it. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him and then stood up, looking over the risen hats. Stand up at the gospel, of course. Then all settled down on their knees again, and he sat back quietly in his bench. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass boy answered each other in Latin. Then the priest knelt down and began to read off a card. O oh God, our refuge and our strength. Mr. Bloom put his face forward to catch the words. English, throw them a bone. I remember slightly. How long since your last mass? Glorious and immaculate virgin. Joseph, her spouse. Peter and Paul. More interesting if you understood what it was all about. Wonderful organization clearly goes like clockwork. Confession. Everyone wants to. Then I will tell you all. Penance. Punish me, please. Great weapon in their hands. More than doctor or solicitor. Woman dying to. And I... Sh 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 sh. And did you cha-cha-cha-cha-cha-cha? And why did you? Look down at her ring to find an excuse. Whispering gallery walls have ears. Husband learned his surprise. God's little joke. Then out she comes. Repentance. Skin deep. Lovely shame. Pray at an altar. Hail Mary and holy Mary. Flowers, incense, candles melting. Hide her blushes. Salvation Army blatant imitation. Reformed prostitute will address the meeting. How I found the Lord. Square-headed chaps those must be in Rome. They work the whole show. And don't they rake in the money, too? Bequests also, to the P.P. for the time being in his absolute discretion. Masses for the repose of my soul to be said publicly with open doors, monasteries, and convents. The priest in that fermana will case in the witness-box. No brow-beating him. He had his answer pat for everything. Liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother, the Church. The doctors of the Church. They mapped out the whole theology of it. The priest prayed. Blessed Michael, Archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over. The women remained behind, thanksgiving. Better be shoving along, Brother Buzz. Come round with the plate, perhaps. Pay your Easter duty. He stood up. Hello. Were those two buttons of my waistcoat open all the time? Women enjoy it, never tell you. But we... Excuse, miss, there's a... Just a... Fluff. With her skirt behind. Placket unhooked. Glimpses of the moon. Annoyed if you don't. Why didn't you tell me before? Still, like you, better untidy. Good job it wasn't farther south. He passed discreetly, buttoning down the aisle and out through the main door into the light. He stood a moment, unseeing by the cold black marble bowl, while before him and behind two worshippers dipped furtive hands in the low tide of holy water. Trams. A car of Prescott's dye works. 
a widow in her weeds. Notice because I'm in mourning myself. He covered himself. How goes the time? Quarter past. Time enough yet. Better get that lotion made up. Where is this? Ah, yes, the last time. Swenny's in Lincoln Place. Chemists rarely move. They are green and gold beacon jars too heavy to stir. Hamilton Long's founded in the year of the flood. Huguenot churchyard near there. Visit some day. He walked southward along Westland Row, but the recipe is in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latch key too. Bore this funeral affair. Oh, well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Oh, wait. I changed a sovereign, I remember. First of the month it must have been, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back page after page. Sandy, shriveled smell he seems to have. Shrunken skull and old. Quest for the philosopher's stone. The alchemist's. Drugs age you after mental excitement. Lethargy, then. Why? Reaction. A lifetime in a night. Gradually changes your character. Living all the day among herbs, ointments, disinfectants. All his alabaster, lily pots, mortar and pestle. Ac dist fol lor te virid. Smell almost cure you like the dentist's doorbell. Dr. Whack. He ought to physic himself a bit. Electuary or emulsion. The first fellow that picked an herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test. Turns blue litmus paper red. Chloroform. Overdose of laudanum. Sleeping draughts. Love filters. Paragoric poppy syrup. Bad for cough. Clogs the pores of the phlegm. Poisons the only cures. Remedy where you least expect it. Clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling slowly the keen reek of drugs, the dusty dry smell of sponges and loofahs, a lot of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said, and then orange flower water. It certainly did make her skin so delicate white like wax. And white wax also, he said. Brings out the darkness of her eyes. Looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes. Spanish, smelling herself, when I was fixing the links in my cuffs. Those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rainwater. Oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk. Skin food. One of the old queen's sons, the Duke of Albany, was it? Had only one skin. Leopold, yes. Three we have. Warts, bunions, and pimples to make it worse. But you want a perfume, too. What perfume does your... Peau de Spagne. That orange flower water so fresh. Nice smell these soaps have. Pure curd soap. Time to get a bath around the corner. Hammam, Turkish. Massage. Dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nicer if a nice girl did it. Also, I think I... Yes, I... Do it in the bath. Curious longing I... Water to water. Combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then all the day. Funeral be rather glum. Yes, sir, the chemist said. That was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Bloom said. Make it up, please. I'll call later in the day, and I'll take one of these soaps. How much are they? Four pence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. Sweet, lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Yes, sir, the chemist said. You can pay all together, sir, when you come back. Good, Mr. Bloom said. He strolled out of the shop, the newspaper baton under his armpit, 
the cool wrappered soap in his left hand. At his armpit, Bantam Lyon's voice and hand said, Hello, Bloom. What's the best news? Is that today's? Show us a minute. Shaved off his mustache again by Jove, long, cold upper lip, to look younger. He does look balmy younger than I am. Bantam Lyon's yellow, black-nailed fingers unrolled the baton. Once a wash, too. Take off the rough dirt. Good morning. Have you used Pear's soap? Dandruff on the shoulders. Scalp wants oiling. I want to see about that French horse that's running today, Bantam Lyon said. Where the bugger is it? He rustled the pleated pages, jerking his chin on his high collar. Barber's itch. Tight collar, he'll lose his hair. Better leave him paper and get shut of him. You can keep it, Mr. Bloom said. Ascot, gold cup, uh, wait, Bantam Lyons muttered. Half a mo, uh, maximum the second. I was going to throw it away, Mr. Bloom said. Bantam Lyons raised his eyes suddenly and leered weakly. What's that? His sharp voice said. I say you can keep it, Mr. Bloom answered. I was going to throw it away that moment. Bantam Lyons doubted an instant, leering, then thrust the outspread sheets back on Mr. Bloom's arms. I'll risk it, he said. Here, thanks. He sped off towards Conway's corner. Godspeed, scut. Mr. Bloom folded the sheets again to a neat square and lodged the soap in it, smiling. Silly lips of that chap. Betting. Regular hotbed of it lately. Messenger boys stealing out to put on sixpence. Raffle for large, tender turkey. Your Christmas dinner for threepence. Jack Fleming embezzling to gamble, then smuggled off to America. Keeps a hotel now. They never come back. Flesh pots of Egypt. He walked cheerfully towards the Mosque of the Baths. Remind you of a mosque. Red baked bricks, the minarets. College sports today, I see. He eyed the horseshoe poster over the gate of College Park. Cyclists doubled up like a cod in a pot damn bad ad. Now, if they had made it round like a wheel, then the spokes, sports, 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 and the hub a big college, something to catch the eye. There's Hornblower standing at the porter's lodge. Keep him on hands. Might take a turn in there on the nod. How do you do, Mr. Hornblower? How do you do, sir? Heavenly weather, really. If life was always like that. Cricket weather. Sit around under sunshades, over after over, out. They can't play it here. Duck for six wickets. Still Captain Culler broke a window in the Kildare Street Club with a slog to square leg. Donnybrook, fair, more in their line. In the skulls we were a-cracking when McCarthy took the floor. Heat wave won't last, always passing the stream of life, which in the stream of life we trace is dearer than them all. Enjoy a bath now, clean trough of water, cool enamel, the gentle, tepid stream. This is my body. He foresaw his pale body reclined in it, at full, naked, in a womb of warmth, oiled by scented, melting soap, softly laved. He saw his trunk and limbs rip rippled over and sustained. Boyed lightly upward, lemon yellow, his navel, bud of flesh, and saw the dark, tangled curls of his bush floating, floating hair of the stream around the limp father of thousands, a languid floating flower. End of chapter five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gesine. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 6. Martin Cunningham first poked his silk hatted head into the creaking carriage and, entering deftly, seated himself. Mr. Power stepped in after him, 
curving his height with care. Come on, Simon. After you, Mr. Bloom said. Mr. Deedalis covered himself quickly and got in, saying, Yes, yes. Are we all here now? Martin Cunningham asked. Come along, Bloom. Mr. Bloom entered and sat in the vacant place. He pulled the door to after him and slammed it twice till it shut tight. He passed an arm through the arm strap and looked seriously from the open carriage window at the lowered blinds of the avenue. One dragged aside, an old woman peeping, nose white flattened against the pane, thanking her stars she was passed over. Extraordinary the interest they'd taken a corpse. Glad to see us go we'd give them such trouble coming. Job seems to suit them. Hugger mugger in corners. Slop about in slipper slappers for fear he'd wake. Then getting it ready, laying it out. Molly and Mrs. Fleming making the bed. Pull it more to your side. Our winding sheet. Never know who will touch you dead. Wash and shampoo. I believe they clip the nails and the hair. Keep a bit in an envelope. Grows all the same after. Unclean job. All waited. Nothing was said. Stowing in the wreaths, probably. I am sitting on something hard. Ah, that soap. In my hip pocket. Better shift it out of that. Wait for an opportunity. All waited. Then wheels were heard from in front, turning, then nearer, then horses' hoofs. A jolt. Their carriage began to move, creaking and swaying. Other hoofs and creaking wheels started behind. The blinds of an avenue passed and number nine with its crape knocker, door ajar, at walking pace. They waited still, their knees jogging, till they had turned and were passing along the tram tracks. Tritonville Road. Quicker. The wheels rattled, rolling over the cobbled causeway, and the crazy glasses shook rattling in the door frames. What way is he taking us? Mr. Power asked through both windows. Irish Town, Martin Cunningham said. Ring's End, Brunswick Street. Mr. Deedalus nodded, looking out. That's a fine old custom, he said. I am glad to see it has not died out. All watched a while through their windows, caps and hats lifted by passers. Respect. The carriage swerved from the tram track to the smoother road, past Watery Lane. Mr. Bloom, at gaze, saw a lithe young man, clad in mourning, a wide hat. There's a friend of yours gone by, Deedalus, he said. Who's that? Your son and heir. Where is he? Mr. Deedalus said, stretching over across. The carriage, passing the open drains and mounds of ridded-up roadway before the tenement houses, lurched round the corner and, sw swerving back to the tram track, rolled on noisily with chattering wheels. Mr. Deedless fell back, saying, Was that Mulligan Cad with him? His Fidus Acatis. No, Mr. Bloom said, he was alone. Down with his Aunt Sally, I suppose, Mr. Deedless said, the Golding faction, the drunken little Costdraw and Chrissy's. And Chrissy, Papa's little lump of dung, the wise child that knows her own father. Mr. Bloom smiled joylessly on Ring's End Road. Wallace Brothers, the Bottle Works, Dodder Bridge. Richie Golding and the Legal Bag. Golding, Collis and Ward, he calls the firm. His jokes are getting a bit damp. Great card he was. Waltzing in Stamer Street with Ignatius Gallagher on a Sunday morning, the landlady's two hats pinned on his head. Out on the rampage all night, beginning to tell him now. That backache of his, I fear. Wife ironing his back. Thinks he'll cure it with pills. All breadcrumbs they are. About 600% profit. He's in with a low-down crowd, Mr. Deedless snarled. That mulligan is a contaminated, bloody, double-nyed ruffian by all accounts. His name stinks all over Dublin. 
but with the help of God and his blessed mother, I'll make it my business to write a letter one of those days to his mother or his aunt, or whoever she is, that will open her eyes as wide as a gate. I'll tickle his catastrophe, believe you me. He cried above the clatter of the wheels. I won't have her bastard of a nephew ruin my son. A counter-jumper's son. Selling tapes in my cousin, Peter Paul Swineys. Not likely. He ceased. Mr. Bloom glanced from his angry moustache to Mr. Power's mild face, and Martin Cunningham's eyes and beard gravely shaking. Noisy, self-willed man, full of his son. He is right. Something to hand on. If little Rudy had lived, see him grow up, hear his voice in the house, walking beside Molly in an Eton suit, my son, me in his eyes. Strange feeling it would be. From me, just a chance. Must have been that morning in Raymond Terrace. She was at the window watching the two dogs at it, by the wall of the cease to do evil. And the sergeant grinning up. She had that cream gown on with the rip she never stitched. Give us a touch, Poldy. God, I'm dying for it. How life begins. Got big then. Had to refuse the Greystones concert. My son inside her. I could have helped him on in life. I could. Make him independent. Learn German, too. Are we late? Mr. Power asked. Ten minutes, Martin Cunningham said, looking at his watch. Molly, Millie, something watered down, had tomboy oaths. Oh, jumping Jupiter, ye golden little fishes. Still, she's a dear girl. Soon be a woman. Mullinger, dearest Papley, young student. Yes, yes, a woman, too. Life, life. The carriage heeled over and back, their four trunks swaying. Corny might have given us a more commodious yoke, Mr. Power said. He might, Mr. Dedalus said, if he hadn't that squint troubling him. Do you follow me? He closed his left eye. Martin Cunningham began to brush away the crust crumbs from under his thighs. What is this? He said, in the name of God. Crumbs? Someone seems to have been making a picnic party here lately, Mr. Power said. All raised their thighs and eyed with disfavour the mildewed, buttonless leather of the seats. Mr. Dedalus, twisting his nose, frowned downward and said, Unless I'm greatly mistaken. What do you think, Martin? It struck me too, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Bloom set his thigh down. Glad I took that bath. Feel my feet quite clean, but I wish Mrs. Fleming had darned these socks better. Mr. Dedalus sighed resignedly. After all, he said, it's the most natural thing in the world. Did Tom Kernan turn up? Martin Cunningham asked, twirling the peak of his beard gently. Yes, Mr. Bloom answered. He's behind, with Ned Lambert and Hines. And Corny Kelleher himself? Mr. Power asked. At the cemetery, Martin Cunningham said. I met McCoy this morning. Mr. Bloom said. He said he'd try to come. The carriage halted short. What's wrong? We stopped. Where are we? Mr. Bloom put his head out of the window. The Grand Canal, he said. Gasworks. Whooping cough, they said. Cures. Good job Millie never got it. Poor children. Doubles them up black and blue in convulsions. Shame, really. Got off lightly with illnesses compared. Only measles. Flaxseed tea, scarletina, influenza epidemics, canvassing for death. Don't miss this chance. Dog's home over there. Poor old Athos. Be good to Athos, Leopold, is my last wish. Thy will be done. We obey them in the grave. A dying scrawl. He took it to heart, pined away. Quiet brute. Old men's dogs usually are. A raindrop spat on his hat. He drew back and saw an instant of shower-spray dots over the grey flags. A part. Curious. Like through a colander. I thought it would. My boots were creaking, I remember now. 
The weather is changing, he said quietly. A pity it did not keep up fine, Martin Cunningham said. Wanted for the country, Mr. Power said. There's the sun again coming out. Mr. Dedalus, peering through his glasses towards the veiled sun, hurled a mute curse at the sky. It's as uncertain as a child's bottom, he said. We're off again. The carriage turned again its stiff wheels, and their trunks swayed greatly. Martin Cunningham twirled more, quiet, more quickly the peak of his beard. Tom Kernan was immense last night, he said, and Paddy Leonard taking him off to his face. Oh, draw him out, Martin, Mr. Power said eagerly. Wait till you hear him, Simon, on Ben Dollard's singing of The Croppy Boy. Immense. Martin Cunningham said pompously. His singing of that simple ballad, Martin, is the most trenchant rendering I have heard in the whole course of my experience. Trenchant, Mr. Power said laughing. He's dead nuts on that. And the retrospective arrangement. Did you read Dan Dawson's speech? Martin Cunningham asked. I did not then, Mr. Dedalus said. Where is it? In the paper this morning. Mr. Bloom took the paper from his inside pocket. That book I must change for her. No, no, Mr. Dedalus said quickly. Later on, please. Mr. Bloom's glance travelled down the edge of the paper, scanning the deaths. Callan, Coleman, Dignam, Fawcett, Lowry, Nauman, Peak. What peak is that? Is it the chap who was on Crosby and Elaine's? No. No, Sexton, Erbright, inked characters fast fading on the frayed breaking paper. Thanks to the little flower, sadly missed, to the inexpressible grief of his, aged eighty-eight after a long and tedious illness. Month's mind, Quinlan, on whose soul sweet Jesus have mercy. It is now a month since dear Henry fled to his home up above in the sky, where his family weeps and mourns his loss, hoping some day to meet him on high. I tore up the envelope? Yes. Where did I put her letter after I read it in the bath? He patted his waistcoat pocket. They're all right. Dear Henry fled, before my patients are exhausted. National School, Meads Yard, The Hazard. Only two there now, nodding, full as a tick. Too much bone in their skulls, the other trotting round with a fare. An hour ago I was passing there, the Jarvis raised their hats. A pointsman's back straightened itself upright, suddenly, against a tramway standard by Mr. Bloom's window. Couldn't they invent something automatic, so that the wheel itself much handier? Well, but that fellow would lose his job then. Well, but then another fellow would get a job making the new invention. Ancient concert rooms. Nothing on there. A man in a buff suit with a crepe armlet. Not much grief there. Quarter morning. People in law, perhaps. They went past the bleak pulpit of St. Mark's, under the railway bridge, past the Queen's Theatre. In silence, hoardings, Eugene Stratton, Mrs. Bantman Palmer. Could I go see Lee tonight, I wonder? I said I. Or the Lily of Killarney? Elster Grimes Opera Company. Big, powerful change. Wet, bright bills for next week. Fun on the Bristol. Martin Cunningham could work a pass for the gaiety. Have to stand a drink or two as broad as it's long. He's coming in the afternoon, her songs, plasters. Sir Philip Crampton's memorial fountain bust. Who was he? How do you do? Mr. Cunningham said, raising his palm to his brow in salute. He doesn't see us, Mr. Power says. Yes, he does. How do you do? Who? Mr. Dedalus asked. Blazes Boylan, Mr. Power said. There he is, airing his quiff. 
Just that moment I was thinking. Mr. Dedalus bent across to salute. From the door of the red bank, the white disc of a straw hat flashed reply. Spruce figure passed. Mr. Bloom reviewed the nails on his left hand, then those of his right hand. The nails, yes. Is there anything more in him that they she sees? Fascination. Worst man in Dublin. That keeps him alive. They sometimes feel what a person is. Instinct. But a type like that? My nails. I am just looking at them, well paired. And after, thinking alone, body getting a bit softy. I would notice that, from remembering. What causes that? I suppose the skin can't contract quickly enough when the flesh falls off. But the shape is there. The shape is there still. Shoulders, hips, plump. Night of the dance dressing. Shift stuck between the cheeks behind. He clasped his hands between his knees and, satisfied, sent his vacant glance over their faces. Mr. Power asked, How is the concert tour getting on, Bloom? Oh, very well, Mr. Bloom said. I hear great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. Are you going yourself? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to County Clare on some private business. You see, the idea is to, tr to tour the chief towns. What you lose on one, you can make up on the other. Quite so, Mr. Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. Have you good artists? Louis Werner is touring her, Mr. Bloom said. Oh, yes, well, we'll have all top novels. J.C. Doyle and John McCormick, I hope, and the best, in fact. And Madame, Mr. Power said, smiling, last but not least. Mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped them. Smith O'Brien. Someone has laid a bunch of flowers there. Woman. Must be his death day. For many happy returns. The carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue united noiselessly their unresisting knees. Oot, a dull-garbed old man from the curbstone, tendered his wares, his mouth opening. Oot. Four bootlaces for a penny. Wonder why he was struck off the rolls. Had his office in Hume Street. Same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy, Crown solicitor for Waterford. Has that silk hat ever since. Relics of old decency. Morning, too. Terrible come down, poor wretch. Kicked about like snuff at a wake. O'Callaghan on his last legs. And Madame. Twenty past eleven. Up. Mrs. Fleming is in to clean. Doing her hair, humming. Voglio e non vorrei. No. Vorrei e non. Looking at the tips of her hairs to see if they are split. Mi tremo un poco il. Beautiful on that tre her voice is, weeping tone. A thrush, a throstle. There is a word throstle that expresses that. Her eyes passed lightly over Mr. Power's good-looking face, greyish over the ears. Madame, smiling. I smiled back. A smile goes a long way. Only politeness, perhaps. Nice fellow. Who knows, is that true about the woman he keeps? Not pleasant for the wife. Yet, they say, who was it told me? There is no carnal. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. Yes, it was Crofton, met him one evening, bringing her a pound of rump steak. Who is this she was? Barmaid, juries. Or the Moira, was it? They passed under the huge cloaked liberator's form. Martin, Cun Martin Cunningham nudged Mr. Power. Of the tribe of Reuben, he said. A tall, black-bearded figure, bent on a stick, stumping round the corner of Elvery's elephant house, showed them a curved hand open in his spine. In all his pristine beauty, Mr. Power said. Mr. Dedalus looked after the stumping figure and said mildly, The devil break the hasp of your back. Mr. Power, collapsing in laughter, 
shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. We have all been there, Martin Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mr. Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, well, nearly all of us. Mr. Bloom began to speak with sudden eagerness to his companions' faces. That's an awfully good one that's going the rounds about Reuben J. and the Sun. About the boatman? Mr. Power asked. Yes. Isn't it awfully good? What is that? Mr. Dedalus asked. I didn't hear it. There was a girl in the case, Mr. Bloom began, and he determined to send him to the Isle of Man out of harm's way, but when they were both... What? Mr. Dedalus asked. That confirmed bloody hobbledy-doy, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Bloom said. They were both on the way to the boat, and he tried to drown... Drown Barabbas, Mr. Dedalus cried. I wish to Christ he did. Mr. Power sent a long laugh down his shaded nostrils. No, Mr. Bloom said, the son himself. Martin Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Reuben and the son were piking it down the quay next the river on their way to the Isle of Man boat, and the young chiseller suddenly got loose and over the wall with him into the Liffey. For God's sake, Mr. Dedalus exclaimed in fright, is he dead? Dead? Martin Cunningham cried. Not he. A boatman got a pole and fished him out by the slack of the breeches, and he was handed up to the father on the quay, more dead than alive. Half the town was there. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, but the funny part is. And Reuben J., Martin Cunningham said, gave the boatman a florin for saving his son's life. A stifled sigh came from under Mr. Power's hand. Oh, he did, Martin Cunningham affirmed, like a hero, a silver florin. Isn't it awfully good? Mr. Bloom said eagerly. One and eightpence too much, said Mr. Dedalus dryly. Mr. Power's choked laugh burst quietly in the carriage. Nelson's pillow. Eight plums a penny, eight for a penny. We had better look a little serious, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Dedalus sighed. Ah, then indeed, he said, poor little Paddy wouldn't grudge us a laugh. Many a good one, he told himself. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said, wiping his wet eyes with his fingers. Poor Paddy. I little thought a week ago when I saw him last, and he was in his usual health, that I'd be driving after him like this. He's gone from us. As decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Dedalus said. He went very suddenly. Breakdown, Martin Cunningham said. Heart. He tapped his chest sadly. Blazing face, red hot. Too much John Barleycorn. Cure for a red nose. Drink like the devil till it turns Adelaide. A lot of money he spent colouring it. Mr. Power gazed at the passing houses with rueful apprehension. He had a sudden death, poor fellow, he said. The best death. Mr. Bloom said. Their wide, open eyes looked at him. No suffering, he said. A moment and all is over. Like dying in sleep. No one spoke. Dead side of the street, this. Dull business by day, land agents, temperance hotel, Faulkner's railway guide, civil service college, guilds, Catholic club, the industrious blind. Why? Some reason. Sun or wind. At night, too, chummies and slavies, under the patronage of the late Father Matthew. Foundation stone for Parnell. Breakdown. Heart. White horses with white frontlet plumes came round the rotunda corner, galloping. A tiny coffin flashed by, in a hurry to bury. A mourning coach. Unmarried. Black for the married. Piebald for bachelors, done for a nun. Sad, Martin Cunningham said, a child. A dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. A dwarf's body, weak as putty, and a white-lined deal box. Burial friendly society pays. Penny a week for a sword of turf. 
Our little bagger baby meant nothing. Mistake of nature. If it's healthy, it's from the mother. If not, from the man. Better luck next time. Poor little thing, Mr. Dedalus said. It's well out of it. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square. Rattle his bones. Over the stones. Only a pauper. Nobody owns. In the midst of life, Martin Cunningham said. But the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed, and put it back. The greatest disgrace to have in the family, Mr. Power added. Temporary insanity, of course, Martin Cunningham said decisively. We must take a charitable view of it. They say a man who does it is a coward, Mr. Dedalus said. It is not for us to judge, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Bloom, about to speak, closed his lips again. Martin Cunningham's large eyes, looking away now. Sympathetic human man he is, intelligent, like Shakespeare's face. Always a good word to say. They have no mercy on that here, or infanticide. Refuse Christian burial. They used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave, as if it wasn't broken already. Yet sometimes they repent too late. Found in the riverbed, clutching rushes. He looked at me, on that awful drunkard of a wife of his, setting up house for her time after time, and then pawning the furniture on him every Saturday almost, leading him the life of the damned. Wear the heart out of his stone, that. Monday morning, start afresh, shoulder to the wheel. Lord, she must have looked a sight that night, Dedalus told me he was in there, drunk about the place and capering with Martin's umbrella. And they call me the jewel of Asia, of Asia, the geisha. He looked away from me. He knows. Rattle his bones. That afternoon of the inquest, the red-labelled bottle on the table, the room in the hotel with hunting pictures, stuffy it was, sunlight through the slats of the Venetian blind, the coroner's sunlit ears, big and hairy, boots giving evidence, thought he was asleep first, then saw little yellow streaks on his face, had slipped down to the foot of the bed, verdict, overdose, death by misadventure. The letter for my son Leopold. No more pain, wake no more, nobody owns. The carriage rattled swiftly along Blessington Street, over the stones. We are going the pace, I think, Martin Cunningham said. God grant he doesn't upset us on the road, Mr. Power said. I hope not, Mr. Cunningham said. That will be a great race tomorrow in Germany. The Gordon Bennett. Yes, by Jove, Mr. Dedalus said. That will be worth seeing, Faith. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. Has anybody here seen Kelly? K E E Y. Dead March from Saul. He's as bad as old Antonio. He left me on my own yo. Pirouette? The mater. Misericordiae, Eccles Street. My house down there, big place. Ward for incurables there. Very encouraging. Our Lady's Hospice for the dying. Dead house, handy underneath. Where old Mrs. Riordan died. They looked terrible, the woman. Her feeding cup and rubbing her mouth with a spoon. Then the screen around her bed for her to die. Nice young student that was dressed that bite the bee gave me. He's gone over the lying in hospital, they told me, from one extreme to the other. The carriage galloped around the corner, stopped. What's wrong now? A divided drove of branded cattle passed the windows, lowing, slouching by on padded hoofs, whisking their tails slowly on their cottled bony groups. Outside them and through them ran rattled sheep, 
bleating their fear. Emigrants, Mr. Power said. Hoo! the drover's voice cried, his switch sounding on their flanks. Hoo! out of that! Thursday, of course. Tomorrow is killing day. Springers. Cuff sold them about twenty-seven quid each. For Liverpool, probably. Roast beef for old England. They buy up all the juicy ones. And then the fifth quarter lost. All that raw stuff. Hide, hair, horns. Comes to a big thing in a year. Dead meat trade. By-products of the slaughterhouses for tanneries, soap, margarine. Wonder if that dodge works now getting dicky meat off the train at Clonsilla. The marriage moved on through the drove. I can't make out why the corporation doesn't run a tram line from the park gate to the quays, Mr. Bloom said. All those animals could be taken in trucks down to the boats. Instead of blocking up the thoroughfare, Mr. Cunningham said. Quite right. They ought to. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, and another thing I often thought is to have municipal funeral trams, like they have in Milan, you know. Run the line out to the cemetery gates and have special trams, hearse and carriage and all. Don't you see what I mean? Oh, that'd be damned for a story, Mr. Dedalus said. Pullman car and saloon dining room. A poor lookout for Corny, Mr. Power added. Why? Mr. Bloom said turning to Daedalus. Wouldn't it be more decent than galloping two abreast? Well, there's something in that, Mr. Daedalus granted. And, Martin Cunningham said, we wouldn't have scenes like that when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's and upset the coffin onto the road. That was terrible, Mr. Powell's shocked face said, and the corpse fell about on the road. Terrible. First round Dumphy's. Mr. Dedalus said, nodding, Gordon Bennett Cup. Praises be to God, Martin Cunningham said piously. Bomb, upset. A coffin bumped out onto the road, burst open. Paddy Dignam shot out and rolling over stiff in the dust in a brown habit too large for him. Red face, grey now, mouth fallen open, asking what's up now. Quite right to close it. Looks horrid open. Then the insides decompose quickly. Much better to close up all the orifice. Yes, also. With wax. The sphincter's loose. Seal up all. Dunphys, Mr. Power announced as the carriage turned right. Dunphys corner. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. A pause by the wayside tip-top position for a pub. Expect we'll pull up here on the way, back to drink his health. Pass round the consolation. Elixir of life. But suppose now it did happen. Would he bleed if a nail, say, cut him on in the knocking about? He would and he wouldn't, I suppose. Depends on where. The circulation stops. Still, some might ooze out of an artery. It would be better to bury them in red. The dark red. In silence they drove along Fibsborough Road. An empty horse trotted by, coming from the cemetery. Looks relieved. Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. Water roaring through the sluices. A man stood on his dropping barge, between clamps of turf. On the towpath, by the lock, a slack-tethered horse. Aboard of the Boogaboo. Their eyes watched him. On the slow, weedy waterway he had floated on his raft, coastward, over Ireland, drawn by a haulage rope, past beds of reed, over slime, mud-choked bottles, carrion dogs. Athlone, Mullingar, Moy Valley. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal. Or cycle down. Hire some old crock. Safety. Wren had one the other day, at the auction, but a lady's. Developing waterways. James McCann's hobby to row me over the ferry. Cheaper transit. By easy stages. Houseboats. Camping out. Also horses. To heaven by water. Perhaps I will without writing. Come as a surprise. Lake Slip. Clonsilla. 
dropping down lock by lock to Dublin, with turf from the Midland bogs. Salute. He lifted his brown straw hat, saluting Paddy Dignam. They drove on past Brian Boromy House. Hear it now, near it now. I wonder how our friend Fogarty is getting on, Mr. Power said. Better ask Tom Kernan, Mr. Dedalus said. How is that? Martin Cunningham said. Left him weeping, I suppose? Though lost to sight, Mr. Dedalus said. To memory dear. The carriage steered left for Finglass Road. The stonecutter's yard on the right. Last lap. Crowded on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared, white, sorrowful, holding out calm hands, knelt in grief, pointing. Fragments of shapes, hewn, in white silence, appealing, the best obtainable. Thos H. Denani, monumental builder and sculptor. Past. On the curbstone before Jimmy Geary, the sextons, an old tramp set, grumbling, emptying the dirt and stones out of his huge dust-brown yawning boot, after life's journey. Gloomy gardens then went by, one by one, gloomy houses. Mr. Power pointed. That is where Childs was murdered, he said, the last house. So it is, Mr. Dedalus said, a gruesome case. Seymour Bush got him off, murdered his brother. Or so they said. The Crown had no evidence, Mr. Power said. Only circumstantial, Martin Cunningham added. That's the maxim of the law. Better for ninety-nine guilty to escape than for one innocent person to be wrongfully condemned. They looked. Murderous ground. It passed darkly. Shuttered, tenantless, unweeded garden. Whole place gone to hell. Wrongfully condemned. Murder. The murderer's image in the eye of the murdered. They love reading about it. Man's head found in a garden. Her clothing consisted of how she met her death. Recent outrage. The weapon used. Murderer is still at large. Clues. A shoelace. The body to be exhumed. Murder will out. Cramped in this carriage. She mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. Must be careful about women. Catch them once with their pants down. Never forgive you after. Fifteen. The high railings of prospect rippled past their gaze. Dark poplars. Rare white forms. Forms more frequent. White shapes thronged amid the trees. White forms and fragments st streaming by mutely, sustaining vain gestures on the air. A felly harshed against the curbstone, stopped. Martin Cunningham put out his arm, and, wrenching back the handle, shoved the door open with his knee. He stepped out. Mr. Power and Mr. Dedalus followed. Change that soap now. Mr. Bloom's hand unbuttoned his hip pocket swiftly, and transferred the paper-stuck soap to his inner handkerchief pocket. He stepped out of the carriage, replacing the newspaper his other hand still held. Paltry funeral, coach and three carriages. It's all the same. Pallbearers, gold reins, requiem mass, firing a volley, pomp of death. Beyond the hind carriage, a hawker stood by his barrow of cakes and fruit. Simnel cakes, those are, stuck together. Cakes for the dead, dog biscuits. Who ate them? Mourners coming out. He followed his companions. Mr. Kernan and Ned Lambert followed. Hines walking after them. Corny Kelleher stood by the opened house and took out the two wreaths. He handed one to the boy. Where is that child's funeral disappeared to? A team of horses passed from Finglass with toiling, plodding tread dragging through the funereal silence a creaking wagon on which lay a granite block. The wagoner marching at the head saluted. Coffin now. Got here before us, dead as he is. Horse looking round at it with plumes skewways. Dull eye, 
collar tight on his neck, pressing on a blood vessel or something. Do they know what they cart out here every day? Must be twenty or thirty funerals every day. Then mount to Rome for the Protestants. Funerals all over the world, everywhere, every minute. Shoveling them under by the cartload, double quick. Thousands every hour. Too many in the world. Mourners came out through the gates. Woman and a girl. Lean-jawed harpy. Hard woman at a bargain. Her bonnet awry. Girl's face, stained with dirt and tears, holding the woman's arm, looking up at her for a sign to cry. Fish's face, bloodless and livid. The mutes shouldered the coffin and bore it in through the gates. So much dead weight. Felt heavier myself, stepping out of that bath. First the stiff, then the friends of the stiff. Corny Kelleher and the boy followed with their wreaths. Who was that beside them? Ah, the brother-in-law. All walked after. Martin Cunningham whispered, I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before, Bloom. What? Mr. Power whispered. How so? His father poisoned himself, Martin Cunningham whispered. Had the Queen's Hotel in Ennis. You heard him say he was going to Clare. Anniversary. Oh, God. Mr. Power whispered. First I heard of it. Poisoned himself? He glanced behind him, to where a face with dark, thinking eyes followed towards the Cardinal's mausoleum, speaking. Was he insured? Mr. Bloom asked. I believe so, Mr. Kernan answered. But the policy was heavily mortgaged. Martin is trying to get the youngster into our chain. How many children did he leave? Five. Ned Lambert said, says he'll try to get one of the girls into Todd's. A sad case, Mr. Bloom said gently. Five young children. A great blow to the poor wife, Mr. Kernan added. Indeed, yes, Mr. Bloom agreed. Has the laugh at him now. He looked down at the boots he had blacked and polished. She had outlived him, lost her husband, more dead for her than for me. One must outlive, one must outlive the other, wise men say. There are more women than men in the world. Condole with her. Your terrible loss. I hope you'll soon follow him. For Hindu widows only. She would marry another. Him? No. Yet who knows after? Widowhood not the, not the thing since the old queen died. Drawn on a gun carriage. Victoria and Albert. Frogmore Memorial Morning. But in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet. Vain in her heart of hearts. All for a shadow. Consort not even a king. Her son was the substance. Something new to hope for. Not like the past she wanted back, waiting. It never comes. One must go first, alone under the ground, and lie no more in her warm bed. How are you, Simon? Ned Lambert said softly, clasping hands. Haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. Never better. How are all in Cork's own town? I was down there for the Cork Park races on Easter Monday, Ned Lambert said. Same old six and eightpence. Stop with Dick Tivy. And how is Dick, the solid man? Nothing between himself and heaven, Ned Lambert answered. By the holy Paul, Mr. Dedalus said in subdued wonder. Dick Tivy bald? Martin is going to get up a whip for the youngsters, Ned Lambert said, pointing ahead. A few bob a skull, just to keep them going till the insurance is cleared up. Yes, yes, Mr. Dedalus said dubiously. Is that the eldest boy in front? Yes. Ned Lambert said, with the wife's brother. John Henry Menton is behind. He put down his name for a quid. I'll engage he did, Mr. Dedalus said. I often told poor Paddy he ought to mind that job. John Henry is not the worst in the world. How did he lose it? Ned Lambert asked. Liquor, what? Many a good man's fault, Mr. Dedalus said with a sigh. They halted about the door of the mortuary chapel. Mr. Bloom stood behind the boy with a wreath, looking down at the sleek combed hair and at the slender furrowed neck inside his brand new collar. Poor boy, 
Was he there when the father? Both unconscious. Brighten up at the last moment and recognize for the last time. All he might have done. I owe three shillings to old Grady. Would he understand? The mutes bore the coffin into the chapel. Which end is his head? After a moment he followed the others in, blinking in the screened light. The coffin lay on its bier before the chancel, four tall yellow candles at its corners. Always in front of us, Corny Kelleher, laying a wreath at each four corner, beckoned to the boy to kneel. The mourners knelt here and there in praying desks. Mr. Bloom stood behind near the front, and when all had knelt, dropped carefully his unfolded newspaper from his pocket, and knelt his right knee upon it. He fitted his black hat gently on his left knee, and, holding its brim, bent over piously. A server bearing a brass bucket with something in it came out through a door. The white-smocked priest came after him, tidying his stole with one hand, balancing with the other a little book against his toad's belly. Who'll read the book? I, said the rook. They halted by the bier, and the priest began to read out of his book with a fluent croak. Father Coffey. I knew his name was like a coffin. Domine namine. Bully about the muzzle he looks. Bosses the show. Muscular Christian. Woe betide any one that looks crooked at him. Priest. Thou art Peter. Burst sideways like a sheep in clover, Daedalus says he will, with a belly on him like a poisoned pup. Most amusing expressions that man finds. Hoon. Burst sideways. Non interest in judicium cum servo tuo domine. Makes them feel more important to be prayed over in Latin. Requiem mass, crepe weepers, black edged notepaper. Your name on the altar list. Chilly place, this. Want to feed well. Sitting in there all morning in the gloom, kicking his heels, waiting for the next please. Eyes of a toad, too. What swells him up that way? Molly gets swelled after cabbage. Air of the place, maybe. Looks full up with bad gas. Must be an infernal lot of bad gas around the place. Butchers, for instance. They get like raw beefsteaks. Who was telling me? Mervyn Brown. Down in the vaults of St. Werber's lovely old organ, 150. They have to bore a hole in the coffins sometimes to let out the bad gas and burn it. Out it rushes, blue. One whiff of that and you're a goner. My kneecap is hurting me. Ow. That's better. The priest took a stick with a knob at the end of it out of the boy's bucket and shook it over the coffin. Then he walked to the other end and shook it again. Then he came back and put it back in the bucket. As you were before you rested. It's all written down. He has to do it. Adne nos inducas in tentationem. The server piped the answers in the treble. I often thought it would be better to have boy servants. Up to fifteen or so. After that, of course... Holy water that was, I expect. Shaking sleep out of it. He must be fed up with that job, shaking that thing over all the corpses they trot up. What harm if you could see what he was shaking it over? Every mortal day a fresh batch, middle-aged men, old women, children, women dead in childbirth, men with beards, bald-headed businessmen, consumptive girls with little sparrows' breasts. All the year round, he prayed the same thing over them all, and shook water on top of them. Sleep. On dignum now. In paradisum. Said he was going to paradise, or is in paradise. Says that over everybody. Tiresome kind of a job. But he has to say something. The priest closed his book and went off followed by the server. Corny Kelleher opened the side doors, and the grave diggers came in, hoisted the coffin again, carried it out, and shoved it on their cart. 
Corny Kelleher gave one wreath to the boy and one to the brother-in-law. All followed them out of the side doors into the mild grey air. Mr. Bloom came last, folding his paper again into his pocket. He gazed gravely at the ground till the coffin cart wheeled off to the left. The metal wheels ground the gravel with a sharp grating cry, and the pack of blunt boots followed the trundled barrow along a lane of sepulchres. The re, the ra, the re, the ra, the roo. Lord, I mustn't build here. The O'Connell circle, Mr. Deedlers said about him. Mr. Power's soft eyes went up to the apex of the lofty cone. He's at rest, he said, in the middle of his people, old Dano. But his heart is buried in Rome. How many broken hearts are buried here, Simon? Her grave is over there, Jack. Mr. Dedalus said. I'll soon be stretched beside her. Let him take me whenever he likes. Breaking down, he began to weep to himself quietly. Stumbling a little in his walk, Mr. Power took his arm. She's better where she is, he said kindly. I suppose so, Mr. Dedalus said with a weak gasp. I suppose she's in heaven, if there is a heaven. Corny Kelleher stepped aside from his rank and allowed the mourners to plod by. Sad occasions, Mr. Kernan began politely. Mr. Bloom closed his eyes and sadly twice bowed his head. The others are putting on their hats, Mr. Kernan said. I suppose we can do so too. We are the last. The cemetery, this cemetery, is a treacherous place. They covered their heads. The reverend gentleman read the service too quickly, don't you think? Mr. Kernan said with reproof. Mr. Bloom nodded gravely, looking in the bl quick bloodshot eyes. Secret eyes, secret searching. Mason, I think. Not sure. Beside him again. We are the last, in the same boat. Hope you'll say something else. Mr. Kernan added, the service of the Irish Church used in Mount Jerome is simpler, more impressive, I must say. Mr. Bloom gave prudent assent. The language, of course, was another thing. Mr. Kernan said with solemnity, I am the resurrection and the life. That touches a man's inmost heart. It does, Mr. Bloom said. Your heart, perhaps, but what price the fellow in the six feet by two with his toes to the daisies? No touching that. Seat of the affections. Broken heart. A pump, after all. Pumping thousands of gallons of blood every day. One fine day it gets bunged up, and there you are. Lots of them lying around here. Lungs, hearts, livers. Old rusty pumps. Damn the thing else. The resurrection and the life. Once you are dead, you are dead. That last day idea. Knocking them all up out of their graves. Come forth, Lazarus. And he came fifth and lost the job. Get up, last day. Then every fellow mousing around for his liver and his lights and the rest of his traps. Find damn all of himself that morning. Pennyweight of powder in his skull. Twelve grams, one pennyweight. Troy measure. Corny Kelleher fell into step at their side. Everyone went off A1, he said. What? He looked at them from his drawling eye, policeman's shoulders, with your turaloom, turaloom. As it should be, Mr. Kernan said. What, eh? Corny Kelleher said. Mr. Kernan assured him. Who is that chap behind with Tom Kernan? John Henry Menton asked. I know his face. Ned Lambert glanced back. Bloom, he said. Madame Marion Tweedy, that was. Is, I mean, the soprano. She's his wife. Oh, to be sure, John Henry Menton said. I haven't seen her for some time. She was a fine-looking woman. I danced with her, wait, fifteen, seventeen golden years ago, at Matt Dillon's in Roundtown. And a good armful she was. He looked behind through the others. What is he? he asked. What does he do? Wasn't he in the stationary line? I fell foul of him one evening, I remember, at Bowles. Ned Lambert smiled. Yes, he was, he said, in Wisdom Healy's, a traveller for blotting paper. 
In God's name, John Henry Menton said. What did she marry a coon like that for? She had plenty of game in her then. Has still, Ned Lambert said. He does some canvassing for ants. John Henry Menton's large eyes stared ahead. The barrow turned into a side lane. A portly man, ambushed among the grasses, raised his hat in homage. The gravediggers touched their caps. John O'Connell, Mr. Power said, pleased. He never forgets a friend. Mr. O'Connell shook all their hands in silence. Mr. Dedalus said, I am come to pay you another visit. My dear Simon, the caretaker answered in a low voice, I don't want your custom at all. Saluting Ned Lambert and John Henry Menton, he walked on at Martin Cunningham's side, puzzling two long keys at his, at his back. Did you hear that one? he asked them. About Malkai from the coon? I did not, Martin Cunningham said. They bent their silk hats in concert, and Hines inclined his ear. The caretaker hung his thumbs in the loops of his gold watch chain, and spoke in a discreet tone to their vacant smiles. They tell the story, he said, that two drunks came out here one foggy evening to look for the grave of a friend of theirs. They asked for Mulcahy from the coon, and were told where he was buried. After traipsing about in the fog, they found the grave, sure enough. One of the drunks spelt out the name, Terence Mulcahy. The other drunk was blinking up at a statue of our saviour the widow had got put up. The caretaker blinked up at one of the sepulchres they passed. He resumed, And after blinking up at the sacred figure, Not a bloody bit like the man, says he. That's not Malkahi, says he, whoever done it. Rewarded by smiles, he fell back and spoke with Corny Kelleher, accepting the dockets given him, turning them over and scanning them as he walked. That's all done with a purpose, Martin Cunningham explained to Hines. I know, Hines said, I know that. To cheer a fellow up, Martin Cunningham said. It's pure good-heartedness. Damn the thing else. Mr. Bloom admired the caretaker's prosperous bulk. All want to be on good terms with him. Decent fellow, John O'Connell. Real good sort. Keys, like keys add. No fear of anyone getting out. No pass-out checks. Habeas corpus. I must see about that ad after the funeral. Did he write Bald's Bridge on the envelope I took to cover when she disturbed me writing to Martha? Hope it's not chucked in the dead letter office. Be the better off a shave. Grey sprouting beard. That's the first sign when the hairs come out grey and temper getting cross. Silver threads among the grey. Fancy being his wife. Wonder he had the gumption to propose to any girl. Come out and live in the graveyard. Dangle that before her. It might thrill her first, courting death. Shades of night hovering there with all the dead stretched about. The shadows of the tombs when churchyards yawn and Daniel O'Connell must be a descendant, I suppose. Who is this used to say he was a queer, breedy man, great Catholic all the same, like a big giant in the dark? Will o' the wisp. Gas of graves. Want to keep her mind off it to conceive at all. Women especially are so touchy. Tell her a ghost story in bed to make her sleep. Have you ever seen a ghost? Well, I have. It was pitch dark night. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. Still they'd kiss all right if properly keyed up. Whores in Turkish graveyards. Learn anything if taken young. You might pick up a young widow here. Men like that. Love among the tombstones. Romeo, splice of pleasure. In the midst of death, we are in life. Both ends meet, tantalizing for the poor dead. Smell of grilled beefsteaks to the starving, gnawing their vitals. Desire to grig people. Molly wanting to do it at the window. Eight children he has anyway. He has seen a fair share go under in his time, lying around him field after field, holy fields. More room if they buried them standing. Sitting or kneeling, you couldn't. Standing? His head might come up some day above ground in a landslip with his hand pointing. 
All honeycombed the ground must be. Oblong cells. And very neat he keeps, he keeps it too. Trim grass and edgings. His garden, Major Gamble calls Mount Jerome. Well, so it is. Ought to be flowers of sleep. Chinese cemeteries with giant poppies growing produce the best opium, Mastiansky told me. The botanic gardens are just over there. It's the blood sinking in the earth gives new life. Same idea as those Jews they said killed the Christian boy. Every man his price. Well-preserved fat corpse, gentleman, epicure, invaluable for fruit garden. A bargain. By carcass of William Wilkinson, auditor and accountant, lately deceased. Three pounds thirteen and six, with thanks. I dare say the soil will be quite fat with corpse manure, bones, flesh, nails, charnel houses. Dreadful. Turning green and pink decomposing. Rot quick in damp earth. The lean old ones tougher. Then a kind of a tallowy, kind of cheesy. They begin to get black, black treacle oozing out of them. Then dried up. Death moths. Of course the cells of whatever they are go on living, changing about. Live forever, practically. Nothing to feed on, feed on themselves. But they must breed a devil of a lot of maggots. Soil must be simply swirling with them. Your head is simply swirls. Those pretty little seaside girls. He looks cheerfully enough over it. Gives him a sense of power, seeing all the others go under first. Wonder how he looks at life. Cracking his jokes, too. Warms the cockles of his heart. The one about the bulletin. Spurgeon went to heaven, 4 a.m. this morning. 11 p.m., closing time. Not arrived yet. Peter. The dead themselves, the men, anyhow, would like to hear an odd joke, or the women to know what's in fashion. A juicy pear, or ladies' punch, hot, strong and sweet. Keep out the damp. You must laugh sometimes, so better to do it that way. Grave diggers in Hamlet. Shows the profound knowledge of the human heart. Down to joke about the dead for two years at least. De mortuis nil nisi prius. Got out of mourning first. Hard to imagine his funeral. Seems a sort of joke. Read your own obituary notice. They say you live longer. Gives you second wind. New lease of life. How many have you for tomorrow? The caretaker asked. Two, Corny Kelleher said. Half ten and eleven. The caretaker put the papers in his pocket. The barrow had ceased to trundle. The mourners split and moved to each side of the hole, stepping with care around the graves. The gravediggers bore the coffin and set its nose on the brink, looping the bands round it. Burying him, we come to bury Caesar. His ides of March or June. He doesn't know who is here, nor care. Now who is that lanky-looking galoot over there in the Macintosh? Now who is he, I'd like to know. Now I'd give a trifle to know who he is. Always someone turns up you never dreamt of. A fellow could live on his, on his lonesome all his life. Yes, he could. Still, he'd have to get someone to sod him after he died, so he could dig his own grave. We all do. Only man buries. No, ants too. First thing strikes anybody. Bury the dead. Say Robin Crusoe was true to life. Well, then Friday buried him. Even Friday buries a Thursday, if you come to look at it. Oh, poor Robinson Crusoe. How could you possibly do so? Poor Dignam, his last lie on the earth, in this box. When you think of them all, it does seem a waste of wood, all gnawed through. They could invent a handsome beer with a kind of panel sliding, let it down that way. Eh, hey, well, they might object to be buried out of another fellow's. They're so particular. Lay me in my native earth, a bit of clay from the holy land, only a mother and dead-born child ever buried in the one coffin. I see what it means, I see. To protect him as long as possible, even in the earth. The Irishman's house is his coffin. 
embalming in catacombs, mummies, the same idea. Mr. Bloom stood far back, his hat in his hand, counting the bared heads. Twelve. I'm thirteen. No, the chap in the Macintosh is thirteen. Death's number. Where the deuce did he pop out of? He wasn't in the chapel, that I'll swear. Silly superstition, that, about thirteen. Nice soft tweed Ned Lambert has in that suit. Tinge of purple. I had one like that when we lived in Lombard Street West. Dressy fellow he was once. He used to change three suits in a day. Must get that grey suit of mine turned by Messias. Hello, it's died. His wife forgot he's not married, or his landlady ought to have picked out those threads for him. The coffin dived out of sight, eased down by the men straddled on the grave trestles. They struggled up and out, and all uncovered. Twenty. Pause. If we were all suddenly somebody else, far away a donkey braid, rain, no such ass. Never see a dead one, they say. Shame of death. They hide. Also poor papa went away. Gentle sweet air blew round the bared heads in a whisper. Whisper. The boy by the grave head held his wreath with both hands, staring quietly at the black open space. Mr. Bloom moved behind the portly kindly caretaker. Well-cut frock coat, weighing them up, perhaps, to see which will go next. Well, it is a long rest. Fear no more. It's the moment you feel. Must be damned unpleasant. Can't believe it at first. Mistake must be. Someone else. Try the house opposite. Wait, I wanted to. I haven't yet. Then darkened death chamber. Light they want, whispering all around you. Would you like to see a priest? Then rambling and wandering. Delirium all you hid your life. The death struggle. His sleep is not natural. Press his lower eyelid. Watching is his nose pointed in his jaw sinking are the soles of his feet yellow. Pull the pillow away and finish it off on the floor since he's doomed. Devil in that picture of sinner's death showing him a woman dying to embrace her in his shirt. Last act of Lucia. Shall I never more behold thee? Bam! He expires. Gone at last. People talk about you a bit. Forget you. Don't forget to pray for him. Remember him in your prayers. Even Parnell. Ivy Day dying out. Then they follow, dropping into a hole one after the other. We are praying now for the repose of his soul. Hoping you're well and not in hell. Nice change of air. Out of the frying pan of life into the fire of purgatory. Does he ever think of the hole waiting for himself? They say you do when you shiver in the sun. Someone walking over it. Call boy's warning. Near you. Mine over there towards Finglas. The plot I bought. Mama. Poor Mama. And little Rudy. The grave diggers took up their spades and flung heavy clods of clay in the coffin. In on the coffin. Mr. Bloom turned away his face. And if he was alive all the time? Phew. By jingo, that would be awful. No, no, he is dead, of course. Of course he is dead. Monday he died. They ought to have some law to pierce the heart and make sure. Or an electric clock or a telephone in the coffin and some kind of a canvas air hole. Flag of distress. Three days. Rather long to keep them in summer. Just as well to get shut off them. As soon as you are sure there's no. The clay fell softer. Begin to be forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. The caretaker moved away a few paces and put on his hat. Had enough of it. The mourners took heart of grace, one by one, covering themselves without show. Mr. Bloom put on his hat and saw the portly figure make his way, its way deftly through the maze of graves. Quietly, sure of his ground, he traversed the dismal fields. Hines jotting down something in his notebook. Ah, the names. But he knows them all. No, coming to me. I am just taking the names, Hines said below his breath. What is your Christian name? I am not sure. L, Mr. Bloom said. Leopold. 
And you might put down McCoy's name, too. He asked me to. Charlie, Hines said writing. I know. He was on the Freeman once. So he was before he got the job in the morgue under Louis Byrne. Good idea, a post-mortem for doctors. Find out what they imagine they know. He died of a Tuesday. Got the run. Levanted with the cash of a few ads. Charlie, you're my darling. That was why he asked me to. Oh, well, there's no harm. I saw to that, McCoy. Thanks, old chap. Much obliged. Leave him under an obligation. Costs nothing. And tell us, Hines said, do you know that fellow in the... fellow was over there in the... He looked around. Macintosh. Yes, I saw him, Mr. Bloom said. Where is he now? Macintosh, Hines said, scribbling. I don't know who he is. Is that his name? He moved away, looking about him. No, Mr. Bloom began, turning and stopping. I say, Hines! Didn't hear. What? Where has he disappeared to? Not a sign. Well, of all the... Has anyone here seen? K-E-L-L. Become invisible. Good Lord, what became of him? A seventh grave digger came beside Mr. Bloom to take up an idle spade. Oh, excuse me. He stepped aside nimbly. Clay, brown, damp, began to be seen in the hole. It rose, nearly over. A mound of damp clods rose more, rose, and the grave diggers rested their spades, all uncovered again for a few instants. The boy propped his wreath against a corner, the brother-in-law his on a lump. The grave diggers put on their caps and carried their earthy spades towards the burrow. They knocked the blades lightly on the turf, clean, one bent to pluck from the haft a long tuft of grass. One, leaving his mates, walked slowly on with shouldered weapon, its blade blue-glancing. Silently, at the grave head, another coiled the coffin band, his navel cord. The brother-in-law, turning away, placed something in his free hand, thanks and silence. Sorry, sir, trouble. Head shake. I know that. For yourselves, just. The mourners moved away slowly without aim, by devious paths, staying at wilds to read a name on a tomb. Let us go round by the chief's grave, Hines said. We have time. Let us, Mr. Power said. They turned to the right, following their slow, th their slow thoughts. With awe, Mr. Power's blank voice spoke. Some say he is not in that grave at all, that the coffin was filled with stones, that one day he will come again. Hines shook his head. Parnell will never come again, he said. He's there, all that was mortal of him, peace to his ashes. Mr. Bloom walked unheeded along his grove by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, stone hopes praying with upcast eyes, old Ireland's hearts and hands. More sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living, pray for the repose of the soul of. Does anybody really? Plant him and have done with him. Like down a coal, sh coal shoot. Then lump them together to save time. All Souls Day. Twenty-seventh I'll be at his grave. Ten shillings for the gardener. He keeps it free of weeds. Old man himself. Bent down double with his shears clipping. Near death's door. Who passed away? Who departed this life? As if they did it of their own accord. Got the shove. All of them. Who kicked the bucket? More interesting if they told you what they were. So-and-so, we'll write. I travelled for Cork Lino. I paid five shillings in the pound. Or a woman's with her saucepan. I cooked good Irish stew. Eulogy on a country churchyard. It ought to be that poem of whose is it? Wordsworth or Thomas Campbell. Entered into rest, the Protestants put it. Oh, Dr. Murrins. The great physician called him home. Well, it's God's acre for them. Nice country residence, newly plastered and painted. Ideal spot to have a quiet smoke and read the church times. Marriage ads they never try to beautify. 
Rusty wreaths hung on knobs, garlands of bronze foil. Better value that for the money. Still, the flowers are more poetical. The other gets rather tiresome, never withering. Expresses nothing. Immortelles. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch. Like stuffed. Like the wedding present Alderman Hooper gave us. Who? Not a budge out of him. Knows there are no catapults to let fly at him. Dead animal even sadder. Silly Millie burying the little dead bird in the kitchen matchbox, a daisy chain and bits of broken chainies on the grave. The sacred heart, that is, showing it. Heart on his sleeve. Ought to be sideways and red, it should be painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it, or whatever that. Seems anything but pleased. Why this infliction? Would birds come then and peck like the boy with a basket of fruit? But he said no, because they ought to have been afraid of the boy. Apollo, that was. How many? All these here once walked around Dublin. Faithful departed. As you are now, so once we were we. Besides, how could you remember everybody? Eyes walk, voice. Well, the voice, yes. Gramophone. Have a gramophone in every grave, or keep it in the house. After dinner on a Sunday. Put on poor old great-grandfather. Cra rock Hello, hello, hello. Or more fully glad crack. Awfully glad to see you again. Hello, hello. I'm of... <laughs> Remind you of the voice like a photograph reminds you of the face. Otherwise you couldn't remember the face after fifteen years, they say. For instance, who? For instance, some fellow that died when I was in Wisdom Ely's. It's strooch. A rattle of pebbles. Wait, stop. He looked down intently into a stone crypt. Some animal. Wait, there he goes. An obese grey rat toddled along the side of the crypt, moving the pebbles. An old stager, great-grandfather, he knows the ropes. The grey alive crushed itself in under the plinths, wriggled itself in under it. Good hiding place for treasure. Who lives there? I lay the remains of Robert Emery. Robert Emmett was buried here by torchlight, wasn't he? Making his rounds. Tail gone now. One of those chaps would make short work of a fellow. Pick the bones clean, no matter what it was, who it was. Ordinary meat for them. A corpse's meat gone by. Well, and what's cheese? Corpse of milk. I read in the voyages in China that the Chinese say a white man smells like a corpse. Cremation better. Priests dared against it. Devilling for the other firm. Wholesale burners and Dutch oven dealers. Time of the plague. Quicklime fever pits to eat them. Lethal chamber, ashes to ashes. Or bury at sea. Where is that Parsi tower of silence? Eaten by birds. Earth, fire, water. Drowning, they say, is the pleasantest. See a whole life in a flash. For being brought back to life? No. Can't bury in the air, however. Out of a flying machine. Wonder does the news go about whenever a fresh one is let down. Underground communication. We learned that from them. Wouldn't be surprised. Regular square feed for them. Flies come before he's well dead. Got wind of dignum. They wouldn't care about the smell of it. Salt white crumbling mush of corpse. Smell. Taste like raw white turnips. The gates glimmered in front, still open. Back to the world again. Enough of this place. Brings you a bit nearer every time. Last time he was here was Mrs. Sinico's funeral. Poor papa, too. The love that kills. And even scraping up the earth at night with a lantern like that case I read of to get at fresh buried females, or even putrefied, with running grave sores. Give you the creeps after a bit. I will appear to you after death. You will see my ghost after death. My ghost will haunt you after death. 
There is another world after death named hell. I do not like that other world, she wrote. No more do I. Plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Feel live warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They are not going to get me this innings. Warm beds. Warm, full-blooded life. Martin Cunningham emerged from a side path, talking gravely. Solicitor, I think. I know his face. Minton, John Henry, solicitor. Commissioner for oaths and affidavits. Dignam used to be in his office. Matt Dillon's long ago. Jolly Matt. Convivial evenings. Cold foul cigars. The Tantalus glasses. Heart of gold, really. Yes, Menton. Got his rag out that evening on the bowling green because I sailed inside him. A pure fluke of mine. The bias. Why, he took such a rooted dislike to me. Hate at first sight. Molly and Flowey Dillon linked under the lilac tree, laughing. Fellow always like that, mortified if women are by. Got a dinge on the side of his hat. Carriage, probably. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Bloom said beside them. They stopped. Your hat is a little crushed, Mr. Bloom said, pointing. John Henry Menton stared at him for an instant, without moving. There, Martin Cunningham helped, pointing also. John Henry Menton took off his hat, bulged out the dinge, and smoothed the nap with care on his coat sleeve. He clapped the hat on his head again. It's all right now, Martin Cunningham said. John Henry Menton jerked his head down in acknowledgement. Thank you, he said shortly. They walked on towards the gates. Mr. Bloom, chap-fallen, drew behind a few places so as not to overhear. Martin laying down the law. Martin could wind a sappy head like that round his little finger without his seeing it. Oyster eyes. Never mind. Be sorry after, perhaps, when it dawns on him. Get the pull over him that way. Thank you. How grand we are this morning. This is the end of section 6 of Ulysses by James Joyce. Read by Gazina in a cafe in Valletta, June 2006.